Washington NFL head coach today. He and his Dolphins visit the Detroit Lions. You see, it was with Detroit in 1960 that Don Shuler began his coaching career as a defensive assistant. Three years later, at 33, he became the youngest head coach in the history of the NFL when he took over the Baltimore Colts and began his long march to 300. But what were Don Shula's greatest triumphs? We all know about two consecutive Super Bowls, his perfect season. Perhaps the measure of Don Shula, the coach, is in the men that he led. Legends of the game. John Unitas, Raymond Berry, Lenny Moore, Larry Zonka, Bob Greasy, Dick Anderson, Mercury Morris, Paul Warfield, Maybe they're the true indication of just how good this coach really is. Maybe his 300th win will take place today against his old team. But even if Rodney Pete and Barry Sanders and company can delay history this week, Don Shula will make it. Maybe not today, but very soon, as he continues down the momentous road leading towards 325 to catch another legend, George Hallis, the NFL's winningest. It's an historic matchup as Don Shula goes for win number 300. NBC Sports presents the National Football League. Today, it's the Miami Dolphins versus the Detroit Lions. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Pontiac Silverdome. This is Charlie Jones and Todd Christensen. Today, the Detroit Lions hosting the Miami Dolphins, who are led by this man, Don Shula, who is going for victory number 300. Detroit has won the toss. They have elected to receive, so Miami will be kicking off. It is warm and just a bit on the humid side here in the Silver Dome, remarkably enough. And here is Wayne Fonts, the head coach of the Detroit Lions. He is going for victory number 17 in his young head coaching career. When we asked Fonts about Shulin and his 300th possibility, he said, you know, Don doesn't play in the game. I don't play in the game. It's up to the players. We are underway. Mel Gray from the five to the 15 and returns to the 23 yard line. 18 yards on the return. And Rodney Pete is the quarterback for the Detroit Lions. That offensive line is Lomas Brown, Andosak, Glover, Utley, and Sanders. Pete, Barry Sanders, Perryman, Farr, Clark, and Green. They go, of course, with the four wide receivers. When they go to what they call their kings, the two slot backs will come out. And Derek Tunnell comes in as a wing back. And Roman Fortin, who is an offensive lineman, becomes the tight end. And they open up with a gift to Sanders. And he has about seven yards to the 30. It's going to be second down and short yardage. Miami's defense, the front seven, Oglesby, Lee, Cross, Griggs, Reichenbach, Offerdahl, and Cox. With Magruder, Jackson, Williams, and Oliver in the secondary. When they go to their dime, Bobby Harden comes in as a linebacker. Kerry Glenn and J.B. Brown come in as defensive backs. One thing you do not want to get is to get caught in that kind of a trap if you're an official. That was a tough shot that he took right here. Barry Sanders cutting back against the grain. There you see Art Demas, the umpire, taking a shot from both Jarvis Williams and Barry Sanders. One of the hazards of being one of the zebras. A gain of five and a first down. At the 35-yard line. No score in the ball game. Opening drive. sideline and picks up a quick five. It'll be second down and five. David Griggs 
was chasing him. Charlie Barry Sanders made a nice block there on a blitzing linebacker coming from the outside. They say that the weakness of Barry Sanders over the last two years, if you can call it that, is that ideally in the run and shoot, you want your guy to be a big back able to block. Here you can see, see the blitz coming from the outside, number 51, Mark Brown. And Pete is able to get up the field and get pretty good yardage, six, seven yards. And he got good backside protection on the block from Barry Sanders. Second and five. Sanders, when we talked to him yesterday, he's not all that keen about blocking. He'd rather run with him. And here he is, doing what he does best. And Griggs again with a tackle. A gain of four. Detroit's doing a lot of the things that they want to do right now. They want to take some time off the clock. That was their problem last year was time of possession. They couldn't take enough time off the clock and let the offense on the field. And as Wayne Fonts told us yesterday, the last thing they want to do is to have Dan Marino on the field more than half of the game. Third down and one. And we will now see that all set that we were talking about, the Kings, where Fortin comes in and Tunnell will come in. And so in reality, they have a tight end. There you see the graphic that we were pointing out, last in the league in time of possession. Also, it goes by the name of Jumbo, simply because of the size of the men who are involved. Sanders around the corner, has the first down, and out of bounds at the 44-yard line of Miami, and Vesty Jackson was chasing him. An impressive opening drive by Detroit to pick up a 13. Charlie, Barry Sanders told us yesterday that he ran a 4-4-40, and I said, nah, 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 now with the legs that size, not at 5'8", 205. But look at him cut to the outside and show some speed. He's able to run right past Jarvis Williams, and look at him turn it on. As I say, you know, maybe he's telling the truth there. Maybe he is 4-4 after all. No question the fact that he is healthy. Three carries, 25 yards rushing on this opening drive. The cheer goes up for Barry, Barry, and he carries again to the 37-yard line. That's At seven and second and three, Brian Cox with the stop. That's twice now on first down. He's had seven-yard carries. That's exactly what the Dolphins don't want. Chris Spielman, the linebacker for the Lions, calls him a ricochet rabbit. <laughs> And he does bounce around. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, I mentioned the 4-4-40. There are a lot of guys in the league that can run 4-4. You get a chance to see it. A look at Chris Spielman, their two-time pro bowler on the inside backer. And very quotable young man. And Barry Sanders, that was 4-4 sideways as well. And that's where that ricochet rabbit line comes from. Tedrick Jackson comes in and carries as Sanders takes a little breather. And he picks up the first down. Well, the Detroit Lions had James Wilder, a veteran backup, and this year they decided to go with some younger people. And there's Cedric Jackson once again on the cutback block. It appears that early on the Miami defense is over-pursuing a little bit and enabling the backs for the Lions to cut back against the grain and get good yardage. Spotted at the 31 of Miami. First down again, opening drive, no score in the ball game. We're in the Silverdome. Cedric Jackson carries over the left side. And you may notice, of course, on the uniforms of the Detroit Lions, the initials of JRT. And that is in honor of John R. Thomas, a former Lion and a little bit of Mr. Everything here in the organization and one of the nicest men that I've ever come in contact with in, the, in sports who passed away earlier this year. And Barry Sanders back into the offensive set at the 28 yard line. Play action fake. Pressure from the backside. Good defensive play. It was the rookie taken in the fifth round of the draft, Brian Cox. Well, Brian Cox was the one earlier who almost got to Pete, and last time it was Sanders that made the block, but this time he's rolling out, and there's nobody to protect him. Brian Cox is one of the reasons that Miami was not in a big hurry to sign Hugh Green, who was a holdout. Now that Hugh Green is back, he can't get his position back from this young man. And it's third down and seven. And Rodney Pete feeling the pressure from the backside. There's Hugh Green on the sidelines of the cap. He will see some action during the ballgame. I have to, go ahead. I was going to say, I have to question that play calling a little bit, the way they've been running so effectively. Here is the draw, and it draws a crowd. No gain, it'll be fourth down. 
And Eddie Murray will come in with a field goal attempt. Eddie Murray, one of the senior citizens of the National Football League, 35 years of age. Eddie is only five points away from making it to the 16th <laughs> senior citizen. Senior citizen at 35? <laughs> no, it is. I got, no, I got this thing in the mail about all these guys in both the <laughs> NFC and the AFC over 30, and Eddie's one of them. I mean, 35 for right, NFL standards. Fine to That's be over old. 30, but no, senior I understand. Standard. I understand. 46-yard field goal attempt. And it is good. As Eddie Murray hits from 46 yards away, and Detroit leads three. Now, Dan Marino, and, and we have to do it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, you record setting 5,084 yards and 48 touchdowns in a single season guy. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> now, I've got you the rest of the season. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a milestone. <laughs> In television history. I'm not talking about his birthday. Very nice. Well, he's my new best friend now that he's making five million a year. Okay, Eddie Murray to kick off. At the 10 yard line, it is Aaron Craver. He breaks it to the 40 yard line. 31 yards on the return. Nico Noga made the tackle as the birthday boy himself comes out. And we'll take another look at the run back. Aaron Craver, the second round pick out of Fresno State. They, they say that he could eventually replace Jim Jensen as the third down back because they like the way he can catch the ball, but I also like the way he runs there. Terrific field position for the Dolphins. Marino celebrating his birthday, also celebrating the fact that he always starts. This is his 111th start. His 111th consecutive start. He comes out throwing it is deflected. Good defensive play by Dennis Gibson, the linebacker who knocked it away. Clayton, the intended receiver. It'll be second down and 10 for Miami back at their own 39-yard line. Dan Marino is one of the few people in the league that has the arm to backpedal going to his going the other direction. Mark Clayton on a crossing route trying to find the seam in the zone. Nice play coming back. The ball would have been behind him anyway. But that was a nice play out there. By number 98, Dennis Gibson. And here is Higgs. Higgs to the outside. Past the 50. Inside the 40. He now has changed the game plan of the Miami Dolphins. Trust me, they're not going to pass. They're going to run with this young man. One of the advantages of being a mere five, seven and a half is you can cut on a dime. Look at the low center of gravity. Here he goes, a 24-yard gain. And look at how strong this young man is. Look at this right forearm come up, and White pays the price. 24-yard gain and a good start for the Dolphins and Higgs. When we talked to him yesterday, he said, you have NBC caps for my big guys, for my offensive line. Already he's learned to take care of them. Yeah, that's because he can't afford to take them to dinner just yet. He's not that rich. <laughs> Reno throws far side. Pass is complete to Clayton. Down the sideline and out of bounds. Charlie, this is going to make Mark Clayton very happy. You know, when we when we talked with him yesterday, he said if Mark Higgs on his first carry gets 20 yards, we are not going to we are not going to pass the ball. That's right. He was wrong. Here it is, the very next play. Mark Clayton on a standard comeback route. Why he's wearing those sunglasses, I'll never know. I asked him. He said, "I like shades." Uh, yeah, that's all well good. He must have a Foster Grant deal or something. There's absolutely no reason he needs shades indoors. Gain of 16, first down. He's a styling kind of guy, though. Got to give him credit. I got a new haircut, too. Did you notice that? I noticed yours, too, and you commented on it. <laughs> <laughs> we both lost our curl. They all like it, though. It's a first down 21-yard line. Opening drive for Miami as they come back to try and counter the field goal. This one is to Duper, and he is out of bounds. Well, we take a deep breath. Let's check the uh, lineups. The offensive line for the Dolphins, Webb, Sims, Widener, Galbraith, and Dennis. And look at the backs and receivers. And when they go to four wide, two running backs tied in come out. Tony Martin and Fred Banks come in as wide receiver, and Jim Jensen Crash comes in as the third down back. First down goal to go. Hicks. And this time they're waiting for him. 
and it's Chris Spielman who was there. When we talked to Chris yesterday, he walked in and he looked at Todd. He said, if I knew that you were going to be here, I would have brought a dictionary. Well, if I knew that I were, <laughs> we were going to play against people like this, I'd have retired long ago. Chris Spielman, two-time pro bowler. And as, as we talked last week a little bit about Steve Young, Chris Spielman is wound tight. Yes. Also, but as he left, he said he wanted a word. And the word that you gave him was? Obsequious. You want to take that home and try it on his wife? Huh? I guess so. That's what he said. Second and go. Loss of the yard. Here is Higgs. Close to the seven-yard line. Third down goal to go. And so now we go to the set that we talked about as Crash Jensen comes in. You know, it's funny. Banks to and Martin come in. I'm sorry. I was going to mm -hmm. say, in this day and age, it's interesting that all of a sudden we have these huge substitutions inside the 10. You go to four wide receivers. That's indicative of of modern football. I mean, in the old days, you know, you might want to try and punch it in, but instead, there it is, four wide. I love looking in the huddle and having Clayton in the shades looking back at you. That's a very impressive statistic you just saw on first downs with the catches from Jim Jensen, but you also have to temper that with the fact that he only does come in on third downs. Reno looks right. Pass is complete at the three to Duper, and he is going to be stacked up at the one-yard line. It's fourth down and goal at the one. You can see Dan Marino was begging for a chance to go for it, but Don Shula says, no, this is way too early in the game. We've got to kick the field goal. Although I must say, it is a moral victory for the Detroit Lions to force the Dolphins after rushing down the field to have to kick in the stage. But what Pete Stoyanovich, it's the wrong end because he has close to 500 friends and relatives in section 113, and that's at the other end of the Silver Dome. He is, there he is. He had a stack of tickets. He said, I've got buses coming from bars, from hotels, from friends' homes. He said, it's unbelievable. Here's to tie it up. And he does. From 24 yards away, and we have a tie at three. We are back to the Silverdome, where, where we are tied at three. The Miami Dolphins and the Detroit Lions. With five minutes and ten seconds left to go in the first quarter. And the key return man is Mel Gray. He's back. They have three deep. They'll have Overton on the left side and Alexander on the right. I asked the reason why, and they said because it's been successful for Fox and so he likes to stay with it. And it is going to be taken by Don Overton. And Overton outside the 30 dives to the 33 yard line for Mike. Iquinello makes the tackle, a return of 23 yards. Rodney Pete comes out. We'll step away for a moment. Miami three, Detroit three. Back a quick check of the 10-minute ticker. Giants, Chicago, no score. Washington leads by seven. Cincinnati by three. San Francisco, Minnesota, no score. Eagles up over Dallas by a touchdown and an extra point. Pittsburgh leading New England. Tampa Bay and Green Bay, no score. And here it is tied. At 3-3, as Detroit has the ball, here is Sanders. And he finds an opening where there is not an opening. He crosses the 40 to the 41-yard line. David Griggs with a stop. Getting a chance to look at Barry Sanders' hands, it looks like he's, he's boxing. Take a look at how he has those taped up. When we asked him about it yesterday, he said that it was a habit that he got into in college because of all the things that get skinned up on the astroturf for him, it's the tops of his hands. And sure enough, as we look, there's a number of scars. It looks like, you know, he's in sparring a few rounds so he said it doesn't bother him catching the ball so great and also we asked him would you like to Oliver goes out the safety Lewis Oliver when we asked Sanders would you like to carry the ball 30 times a game he said no no well, that's no, no. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so used to runners to say oh absolutely give it to me as much as possible but he wants a very long career and he knows 30 carries ain't the way to get it but he does get the first down as he goes to the 45-yard line, picks up four. Did I just say eight? Yes. Wow. As in misbehaving. Very good. And Detroit's first drive, 49 yards rushing, no yards passing. But the run and shoot, run does come first. In this case, well, if you have Barry Sanders, the run always comes first. Look what he's done already. Eight carries, 47 yards rushing for Barry Sanders. Interestingly, in the first two years in the league, Barry Sanders matched Jim Brown's all-time record of averaging 5.2 yards a carry. Obviously, he hasn't done it as long as Jim Brown has, but at the rate he's going thus far today, he's fine. 
He has pressure. Looked for a moment as if he wanted to run a wide option. They do have the option, but uh, Sanders had already moved upfield. Briggs was there covering for Miami. Very curious the way they do this. They have a rollout. Sanders is in the flat, actually, here, just looping out, trying to get the ball. Now you're going to see that he doesn't know what to do. Do I block this guy? Do I let him go? He lets the first guy go, blocks the second. But that's too late. It's the first guy, Griggs, who ends up getting Pete. Loss of a couple, second down and 12. Why don't you throw the ball when you're running this effectively? And they mark that as a sack. And a gain of a yard to the 44. So it'll be third down, 11, Sean Lee and David Briggs with the tackle. I don't know. I would think that the, with the running attack going, you just stay with it. You know, when I, years ago, when, when Kenny Stabler was with the Raiders, uh, as we get a chance to look at the defensive coordinator, Tom Olivadotti from the Dolphins, he used to run Hubbard and Van Egan, and it used to be just where he continued to hand off and hand off until you stop us. And thus far, they have not stopped Barry Sanders. So really, I don't understand the need to throw the ball at this point. Obviously now third and long, but earlier didn't make much sense. And this is the standard set with Willie Green, Mike Farr, Robert Clark, and Brett Perryman is the four wide receiver. And it is over the middle and dropped by Willie Green. And he had enough yards for the first down. J.B. Brown had picked him up on the coverage for Miami. It'll be fourth and 11. It appeared that it might have got somebody at the line of scrimmage might have gotten a piece of it, and it was, in fairness to Willie Green, a little bit behind him. But still, this is a very catchable ball. Right there, you can see the trajectory is altered just a little bit by Offerdahl, but the professional receiver's got to make that catch. You can see the frustration on Pete as he walked off the field. So fourth down, Jim Arnold will be kicking 106 consecutive punts without a block. And the return man is the rookie from UCLA, Scott Miller. Scott Miller is one of the reasons that they were able to trade Randall Hill. Oh, good tip. A flag is down. The ball goes out at the five-yard line. But there was a marker back at the 45. It's a 50-yard kick. Penalty mark for that. Charlie, it's this is an illegal procedure against the kicking team, this, so they'll bring it back. This just drives a punter crazy. I mean, how much better could a punt get than this? A 40-yard 40, 40 punt right on the nose inside the 10. Yards. Yeah. Illegal formation. Only six men on the line of scrimmage on a kicking team. Repeat fourth down. You know, punters don't get that much of an opportunity. When they get their one chance to go in and make a play, as Jim Arnold just did there, a big play for his team. Very frustrating when something foolish like this occurs. Jim Arnold... Jim Arnold's been around the block. Let's take a look at the number of people if we can. Evidently one of the younger players. And you can count, and they have to be, have, you know, if you go two, back to Pop Warren. Three, four, four, five, six, six, seven, eight. No, no, no. no. Oh, hey, where am I going? No, no, you got to have seven on the line of scrimmage. You know, then they only have six. So on the, out, so on the outside, they have sprinters. Yeah. Well, it's an illegal formation. So what does that add up to? It adds up to one less than you need on the line. Ah. That's up to five yards and, and a little frustration on the part oh, of Jim Arnold. Yeah. Miami would have had the ball first down at their own five yard line. He goes to the opposite side. The ball does not turn over. And he gets a pretty good roll. He does an excellent job. It'll go out just inside the 15 yard line. And he is still going to Mark Higgs. And Higgs picks up about seven yards on the play. It's going to be second down and three. This is a milestone for Don Shula from another standpoint. 28 years ago today, the date of his first game as head coach. That was the Baltimore Colts. They lost to the Giants. And as you know by now, of course, he's going for number 300. Well, there are two games that nobody counts because uh, the uh, NFL has decided that these were like exhibition games. This was the playoff bowl. There were a total of 10 of them. And when he was with the Colts, he won two of them. First, it was the runner-up bowl and then the playoff bowl, but everybody kind of ignores it. Vince Lombardi used to refer to those games, though, as hinky-beaky bowls played by hinky-beaky people. He said that those were games from losers. Remember, he actually said that. That Shula is 2-0 and in hinky beats. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Tony Page on the receiving end of a Marino pass. Jameson with 
the tackle at the 26 yard line it should be the first down you know we had a chance to talk about Tony Page a little bit earlier and how important he is to the Dolphin offense you know it reminds me a little bit of how important people like Don Warren are to the Redskin offense or Steve Smith to the Raiders or Maurice Carthen to the Giants these are the people that work very hard don't get a lot of notoriety do the things that are tough things like block and catch short passes but they are integral to the success of the offense particularly here in the Dolphins case Greg Beatty has replaced Edmonds at tight end for Miami. And here is his shut off inside. Good defensive play. They string him out, and that's exactly what the defense wants to do. As Spielman and Jamison drop him for a loss, we'll check in with the 10-minute ticker. No score still. Giants and Chicago. Washington up now by two touchdowns over Phoenix. As you can take a run down the list. San Francisco leading. Philadelphia leading. Pittsburgh three in front of New England and no score between the Bay and here it is died Miami three and Detroit three a loss of two it is second down and 12 as we'll take the countdown now to the end of the first quarter so here in the Silver Dome the score is Miami three Detroit three we'll be back in just a moment This is Charlie Jones, Todd Christensen inside of the Silver Dome where it is hot and muggy. I'll tell you, the temperature's got to be in the 80s. <laughs> no, in this booth, it's got to be 100. I picked the wrong day to wear black. Ooh. Second and 12, Miami. You know, this is really wants to set up. He goes downfield. It is incomplete to Duper. Ray Crockett had the coverage in the first quarter for Miami. Mark Higgs, five carries, 31 yards rushing, 31 yards rushing. And Barry Sanders, first quarter, nine carries, 48 yards rushing. Well, then Higgs is on a pace definitely to set history. As we mentioned, despite all the great runners they've had, Larry Zonka, Mercury Morris, people like that, they never did have a runner have three straight 100-yard games. And it doesn't take Fellini to figure out that four times 31 exceeds 100. Fellini? Mark Fellini? No, oh, Federico. 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 Oh, that Fellini. That Fellini. Oh, that Fellini. <laughs> Third down and 12. Jensen is in. Banks is in and Tony Martin is in. It is incomplete. You can find a flag. There it is. Yes. Sheldon White is going to lose this argument. He hooked him with his hand. Tony Martin, the intended receiver. And you can see it from up here. Well, you know, this is one of those situations where you might want to talk about incidental contact. Who pushes off where? No, but he hooked him right there with his hands. That's what he saw when he went down. He reached out with that left hand and got it. I understand that, but Martin used his right hand to fend him off as well. No, that's no, you're, you're right, but that's what the official saw because he had the same angle as we had. But the official that threw it threw it from the middle, and both guys are there together. He sees left and right. That should have been incidental contact. Trust me, it's not. It's the first down at <laughs> the Detroit 41. Take a, a look. Take, oh, yard okay, he's stumbling right there with the right yeah, hand. But, okay, but yes, you're right. With his okay, left. he did. I can see this. All right, all right. I, can, I concede. Okay, I saw the sweatbands come down. Make all right. Okay. Hard for you. Last thing see. we need to do is get hot and sweat some more up here in this room. First fire. First fire. Excuse me. Glow. Glow. There you go. Over the middle. This is Tree Edmonds, the tight end. They'll spot it at the 35 yard line. It'll be second down and four. Farrell Edmonds has made the last two Pro Bowls as the tight end for the Dolphins, but he's yet to exceed 40 catches in a season. I asked Don Schuler about the possibility of integrating him more into the offense, but in reality, he said that his strength really as is, is as a pass blocker, and at 6'6", 255, he certainly has the size to do it. Officially, it's the 34-yard line, so it is second down and three. Bouncing through to the 30-yard line. He adds four to his total, and he picks up the first down. Lawrence Pete, who is the starting nose tackle, replacing Jerry Ball, who's bothered by that hamstring, although Ball may see some action. This is actually terrific penetration. You can see right there, Spindler has a shot at him, as does Gibson there, but he's able to cut inside, knife in for five yards. Once again, at the risk of being redundant, it helps on this AstroTurf to be 5758 because of that incredible center of gravity. You can, see, you can see right there, Jerry Ball with a hamstring injury, a big loss for the Detroit Lions because I'm talking to Harry Galbraith yesterday, he just had raves about how good Jerry Ball is for the Detroit Lions. First down at the 30. 
pitch. Shut off inside, cuts outside, and goes to the 25. So he has five, and it'll be second down and five. And I tell you, if Hicks continues to run like this, Sammy Smith, who's on IR, who's uh, watching the game, is going to say, I've got my work cut out to get back. Well, you know, it's interesting. This just goes to show that judging talent is hardly an exact science in the National Football League. Mark Higgs put on plan B by the Dallas Cowboys, put on plan B by the Philadelphia Eagles. And now, as we mentioned, you know, near the last cut, Don Shula admitted to us if these other two guys aren't hurt, Higgs might get waved. He might have gotten waved. Might not have made the final cut down. But we do what Todd was talking about. Injuries and holdouts. He had his opportunity and took advantage of it. Spielman makes the tackle. So now instead of sitting at home waiting for the phone like so many other prospective NFLers are, he's out here on the point of making history. The possibility, as we mentioned earlier, of three straight 100-yard games. There you can see in his first three years in the league the attempts and yardage and what he has done thus far in 1991 in only two games. That's impressive. 251 his previous career. This year, 257 plus what he already has in this ballgame. Well, it just goes to show, you know, opportunity knocks, but you've got to open the door, and it looks to me like in the first two games, Higgs has kicked it in. <laughs> 33, and Marino wants a timeout. 11.59 is the time remaining. We're in the second quarter, and the ballgame is tied. Miami 3 and Detroit 3. And we'll step aside for just a moment and come back to the Silverdome. 11.59 left to go in the second quarter. We're tied at three. Aaron Craver is the back with Marino from the shotgun. Pass is complete for the first down. It is Fred Banks as he goes to the 10. He picks up 13 yards. On a third down and three, Melvin Jenkins with the tackle. Well, Melvin Jenkins had him. It was simply man-to-man -man coverage, and Dan Marino is going to pick that apart 90% of the time. Simply an out route. He's going to take about eight, about six steps down, little inside move. That's called a swirl and out. That's a swirl. Jenkins isn't able to get him. He's able to get some extra yardage there as his friends come to help, but that's too late. First down, Dolphins. He spotted at the 10, so it is first down and goal to go. Higgs is back in as a running back. And Higgs carries. And he has five yards to the five. His total now, nine carries, 47 yards rushing. That exactly matches a total of Barry Sanders at this point of nine carries, 47 yards rushing. As they threaten to score, a quick look at the ITT 10-minute ticker. And we'll kind of hurry through this. No score, Washington on top, Cincinnati leading Cleveland. San Francisco leading, Philadelphia leading. New England, Pittsburgh now tied. No score, Tampa Bay, Green Bay. Here we're tied at three. And it's second down goal to go five yard line. And Higgs, shut off outside, comes back inside, touchdown. Miami. Frustrating for the Detroit defense because they're pursuing to, pers to get this little Higgs, but for some reason he's able to cut back. Take a look here as he comes to the outside. This is a sweep designed to go to the outside. He cuts back over the zero hole, which is actually where the center is supposed to be, and there's nobody home. And you think at 195 pounds this young man isn't strong? Lays the ball on the line. The ref says that's good enough for six. You can see Shula's reaction right there. Not overly emotional. Well, it's still early in the game. Of course, he has been in a few games, right? Yeah. Driven home the point that this is his 28th season. And the extra point is good. And the score is now Miami 10, Detroit 3. We'll be back with the kickoff. Which will be kicking off with the Miami Dolphins. Mel Gray. It was the key return man for the Detroit Lions. You know, Charlie Mel Gray earlier in the, in the football's fastest man competition had the third fastest time at age 30. And when we got a chance to talk with him yesterday, I said, hey, Mel, you know, I have to be over in Tokyo. And I saw another 30-year-old man run pretty fast, a guy named Carl Lewis. So don't think you're getting old. He said, you know what? You're right. I actually think I'm getting faster. His 40-yard time is faster. 
And he takes it two yards deep in the end zone. Good special teams coverage by the Dolphins. Bobby Harden got him. Let's go to the tail of the tape. Here, we, here we're looking at Mark Hicks, who already is halfway to his goal of 100 yards, and there's Barry Sanders. We've got a chance to make a, a boxing-like comparison, and you can see they're practically the mirror image of one another. Height, weight, neck, waist, thigh, and age. Very, very close, and also very, very close in statistics. Mark Higgs with 10 carries for 52 yards. Barry Sanders, 9 carries for 47 yards. 17 yards on that return by Meldrin. It just must be so exciting right now to be Mark Higgs. Oh, you know, yeah. To go from oh, oblivion to stardom in such a short period of time, it just must be great. Well, you know, he said, I'm having more fun when we talked to him yesterday. And here is the completion to Perryman. Perryman played his collegiate ball at Miami of Florida and then came to Detroit in a trade from New Orleans. He picks up a quick 20 yards. Oh, he made both Vesty Jackson and Lewis Oliver look foolish. This is a quick out route. You can see the blitz coming, and he has blitz protection. He cuts out. Now watch the 360. Whoop, goodbye. Both guys get caught up in it. And if he just had another gear right there to escape, he might have gone the distance. And that is Pete's first completion of the ball game. One of three. He's been sacked one time. Looked like he might have landed on the ball, might have bruised his ribs. That's the last thing they need because they already have two of their key players, Barry Sanders and Michael Coulter, with rib injuries. Perriman, the former New Orleans Saint out of Miami University. And Mel Gray has replaced him in the lineup. And it's a throwback screen to Sanders, and look at him move, but he gets just a little bit of opening. We have a flag back at the 36-yard line, but that's just feel. There's no time to see the opening. That's just a feel move. What inevitably happens, I was about to say, and they tell it right there is that when you have that screen pass out of the run and shoot or silver stretch or whatever it is they're calling it right now he's going to roll to the left now alignment is, is supposed to count 1001 1002 let his man go and then run downfield now because Pete has to buy a little extra time right there you can see Lomas Brown number 75 is already and downfield number 65 well, that was uh, Sack was also down well they had two of them they no. could have picked one or the other but both of them were beyond the line of scrimmage and it's too bad because that's a terrific play for the Lions because it gets Sanders a chance to get out in the open field. You can see Andelsek right there. A little yep. upset with himself, but, you know, he, he's the one that has to go on time. In penalties, Detroit 3 for 50. Miami, 0. And it's first and 20. And Miami seems to always lead the league in the fewest penalties. It is intercepted drop. Jarvis Williams was mentally in the end zone. He forgot to take the ball with it. He did a good job of timing that out. Now let's go to NFL Live. Bob? And the Cincinnati Bengals can't get in the end zone, Charlie, mentally or otherwise. Fourth down, less than a yard, inside the Cleveland 10. Esiason on the keeper. The whole Browns defense converges on him. He's stuffed. The Bengals stop. They have a 3-0 lead on an earlier Jim Breach field goal of 21 yards, but the expression on Sam Weish's face tells you the Bengals are 0-2 and, and not on track yet. Charlie? Thank you, Bob. As we come back, Rodney Pete rolls left by some time, and it is incomplete. Willie Green could not hold on to this one, so he is 0 for 2. The first one was behind him earlier in the ballgame. And uh, deflected a little, but this also was catchable. Very frustrating on the part of Rodney Pete. He, he's bouncing around the pocket. He has to go out, buy some time. Does a good job rolling to his left. This is a terrific throw by a right-hander going to his left. Puts it right on the Ooh. chest. Goes right through his arms. Pete, 1 of 5 for 20 yards. Certainly those numbers are deceiving considering those two drops that would have added about 40 yards to his total. There is Raymond Berry, the quarterback coach. He's trying to buy some kind of time, and he buys enough to throw it away. And they're going to drop a flag. Now, he had a receiver right down the sideline. No, they're going to call roughing the passer, Charlie. They're going to call roughing the passer on Sean Lee, the nose guard. Here you're going to see, once again, almost a, a carbon copy of the last play, rolling to his left, trying to get out. Now watch, he's going to throw the ball away. Watch at the last minute what Lee does. No, no I can't agree. Be. Once again, it, the angle is the issue. The angle that he saw appeared that when his oh. arms went up, he was trying to push people, oh. but in reality, he was trying to evade him. 
That's a bad call. Personal foul. Roughing the passer. Number 98 on the defense. Automatic first down. He's pleading his case he's right, right there, Charlie. He's putting his arms up. He's saying, hey, Coach Shula, I put my arms up, not trying to push him, but to avoid him. Now what? He pushes him. Well, you can't see it. But from the other angle, we're able to see his yeah. arms came up. That was what you would say in the vernacular as a terrible call. Plus the fact that he was out of the pocket and he's a runner. And it is a first down at the 39-yard line. And here is Sanders. I wonder if we could take another look at the first replay that we had because he did. He got his hands up and he avoided him and just went sliding by trying to stay off of him, and he did. Well, I certainly understand that the officials want to protect the quarterbacks, but you're going to see here that, that he is definitely not in any danger. He throws the ball. Now watch Lee's reaction. He gives him a little push on the shoulder right there with the head, but now he backs off. Look, he backs off and puts his hands up. So you can see the hands. So he said, I'm not pushing him. I'm not touching him. That's he exactly did right. Bad call. I can understand why he's a little bit disgruntled right there. Second down and five. Miami out in front. Jim Street pass is complete to Mel Gray, 50-yard line. He picks up six in the first down. Cox was there to pull him down. Gray likes being into the offense. He said he, he wants to be more and more into the offensive shot, and they said they were going to try and get him in. He said sometimes they don't tell you the truth. Well, last week he had a kickoff return of over 50 yards. He had a punt return of over 20, and he caught a pass for over 30. So, you know, Dave Levy, the offensive, excuse me, Dave Levy, the offensive coordinator, was telling me that they want to get the ball in the hands of Mel Gray because he can do some exciting things if afforded the opportunity. They've also had another great statement about it. Here's Sanders. 39-yard line, gain of 11, first down. You know, I realize that, you know, you want to prolong the career of Barry Sanders. You don't want to get him hurt. You don't want to use him too much. But, boy, he is so excited. And the temptation, if you're an offensive coordinator, is much like what Bum Phillips used to do with Earl Campbell. Let's go Barry right and Barry left and see what happens. But, again, you got to remember that Barry Sanders at 5'8 and 205 is not that kind of big bruising back. So you can't afford the luxury, apparently, of giving him the ball 30 times. You can see right there with his 11 rushes at nearly six yards of carry that he does his damage in a short period of time. And Cedric Jackson comes in to replace him. Play action fake. Ooh. Down the sideline. Pass is complete at the 25-yard line. And it's Robert Clark. Bad hands and all. And that really has to hurt. It's been documented around the country. You've got the medical report on his hands. Well, first of all, you get a chance to see the route run by Robert Clark. Makes a good move. Look like, looks like he's going to the post. Good job with the head. Comes back and makes the catch. Terrific throw by Rodney Pete. Nice timing. Get a chance to look at the injury of the hands of Robert Clark. This is a man that caught 10 passes last week. Right here, this finger is broken. These two fingers right here, one has ligament damage and the other is dislocated. Now, you know, that's okay if you're going to sell life insurance or teach school. But if you're going to catch passes, that doesn't help at all. Pete with time, goes deep, and it's caught, touchdown! Willie Green! Willie Green atones in a big way for his two earlier gaffes. You can see he's going to break this off because Rodney Pete starts to run around. He was just, he wasn't, he wasn't even involved in the offense. A lot of times the four wide receivers here, you can see Vesty Jackson actually has pretty good coverage on him, but his back is turned, and as a result, Willie Green's able to make the catch for the score. And Eddie Murray adds a point after, and we are tied again at 10. Miami. This is Charlie Jones, Todd Christens at 6-13, left to go, first half. Miami 10, Detroit 10, Don Shula going for victory number 300. Wayne Fonts, head coach Detroit, going for his 17th victory against 23 losses. It'll be down in the end zone. They'll have it at the 20-yard line. Here's Todd. One of the things of the, of the running... 
excuse me, we're going to have a penalty here, so we're not going to get a chance to do this. Let's oh, see well, what let's it is. Have a chance. Let's have a... Go ahead. One of the things with the run and shoot offense is that you cut the field in half, and a lot of times two guys on this side are not actually even involved. The people up here are the ones that are going to be involved. But what happens is you're going to see Pete roll out, and all of a sudden, Willie Green, who's up the field just loafing, now gets involved, cuts up the field, and is able to get the gratis touchdown. Gratis touchdown? Gratis touchdown. He had he, to fight for look it. At the, no, no, no. He's involved in the right side. Now watch where he rolls to the left. Look, Willie Green's loafing. Now he cuts back, and Pete's the one that makes the play. He makes a nice catch and all, but it's not as if he was running a really hard route. He was not involved in the play. There was no flag on the play. The foul occurred after the ball was dead. First down. They've got to figure out different terminology, like the flag does not count, but to say there was no flag on the play goes against that big yellow marker that's sitting out there on the field. And it certainly confuses everybody in the oh, stands. Yes. They want to know, I don't understand, why isn't that a flag? And the reason is, is that once he kneels down and it's a touchback, whatever else happens after that, unless it's a flagrant personal foul, they're not going to call. Marino, 6 of 8, 58 yards. Higgs, 10 carries, 53 yards. Rushing, incomplete. Duper reached out with one hand and tried to pull it back, and he couldn't. Jink on NFL Live. 49ers and Saints interested in Broncos' Bobby Humphrey. Packers won't trade Tim Harris. The big one, NFL will offer players collective bargaining agreement within 30 days. That is a big move. Very big move, and having been a player and been involved in two strikes, I hope that that's something that can rectify the situation a little this next month. And NFL Live uh, at halftime, the domino pizza halftime. Pizza halftime report. Here's a swing to hit left side. Out near the 25-yard line, so it'll be third down. And still five, maybe six to go as Jamison makes the tackle for Detroit. Another flag down, Charlie. Look at Don Shula's reaction. He's, he's amazed. You know, people... You know, the, the coaches... Offensive are, pass interference is the signal. Well, but exactly. The coaches around the league feel like he has a competitive advantage since he is on the competition and rules committee. They feel that it's no coincidence <laughs> that they're the least penalized team in the league, but the fact is is that they're a very pass disciplined team and always have been. Number 85 on the offense, 10-yard repeat. And it's on down. Mark Duper, and we'll take a look at it. Well, this is very strange because all he's doing is running people off. He's just supposed to run the guy off in this case because <laughs> it's a screen pass. He's not even involved. That, that's a crazy call. He collides with him. He blocks him much too soon. Once again, a ticky-tack ticky -tack foul. The screen play was to Higgs, and so all Duper's supposed to do is run downfield and get in the way of the guy. No way that's pass interference. The ball goes, well, I think it is. Because, well, he blocked him downfield, and he knows that it's a pass, and he can't hit him until the, but the, the ball is completed. But the guy came up to him and got in the way. How can you say that? Well, because he put his shoulder into it. This time they go to Tony Martin. And Jamison with the stop. And his third down. You know, Marino made an interesting point yesterday when we were chatting. He said, you know, with Higgs running the ball, that's all well and good because we do want to establish the running game. But he said, when we get in games where I have to throw 40 times a game, I'm out of practice. You know, we can't just beat up on some of the smaller teams and carry the ball 20, 25 times and expect me to have the same rhythm come a game when we need me to throw 30 or 40 times. Well, we mentioned that he is now 30 years old today, so, you know, he is beginning to age. But you said, wait till he's 35. You've got station wagon in Little League. That's right. And he had a funny expression on his face. <laughs> Reno far side pass is complete to Mark Clayton, and they pick up the first down. Jenkins with the tackle. One of the most frustrating things for Wayne Fonts right here as a former defensive coordinator is to give up a long third down. Here you come up third and 13. You go back into zone coverage and assume that you'll make him throw it underneath, but Marino has way too much time. And he's able to fire into the seam of the zones, and as everybody knows, Marino to Clayton has been around a very long time. Wayne Fonts, the head coach of the Detroit Lions. Former defensive coordinator with the Tampa Bay Bucks, and you can see right there by the look on his face, he's not very happy with what happened there defensively. But again, if you can't rush Marino, he's going to pick you apart. Tony Page moves to the left side. He goes left, and he picks up a couple. It'll be second down. Mark Spindler with the stop. 
know, I mentioned that mentioned Marino to Clayton. You know, that's a combination that's been around a long time, and people don't realize how they've connected. 67 touchdowns. That's the highest scoring combination in the National Football League history. And people think back and say, well, what about Unitas to Barry, or what about Montana to Rice? They're all well behind them. 67 touchdowns. Very impressive. And in this ball game, Marino eight of 11 for 82 yards, two receptions for Clayton, 33 yards for Marino. And he goes deep to him again, and he can't pull it in. Oh, he has to adjust the sunglasses. Perhaps the reflection off of the silver dome is the reason that he's wearing the shades. Either that or he's the biggest Ray Charles fan I know. <laughs> Be that as it may, you can see right here. Watch him fend off with the left hand. There he's going to reach out. Almost has the catch. Pretty good coverage there by Crockett, and he's arguing a little. You know, it's a little bit of a... You know what they call incidental contact. I don't think it was that big a deal. But again, if you're an offensive guy, you're always going to complain for that. And I think Clayton's actually a little more disgusted with himself that he couldn't come up with a fabulous catch. Third down and eight. This is Miami's third offensive possession. The first one led to a field goal. The second one led to a touchdown. Marino is stuck. Flag down in the secondary. against Detroit. Big mistake. Very, very costly. It would have been fourth down. Miami would have had to kick. Second costly penalty. Well, this is one of the... This is a rarity right here. The Miami Dolphins have been the least Holding sacked team. Number 25 on the defense. Five yards. Automatic first down. 25 is Sheldon White. The Dolphins have been the least sacked team in the National Football League over the last eight seasons. And so that's exactly what they needed from Michael Colfer, who sat out last week with ribs, is to get a sack. But again, the frustration of having to come back. Bad penalty in the secondary, as you mentioned. Automatic first down, 41-yard line. Farrell Edmonds, and he is really done. And that's a big man bringing down a big man. George Jamison, 6'1", 228. Farrell is 6'6", 254. And we have an injured player. Looks like it's Michael Colfer. That would be a real loss for the Lions because this is their best pass rusher. With a check of the 10-minute ticker, Chicago now up by 10 over the Giants. Washington two touchdowns ahead of Phoenix. A baseball score, Cincinnati three, Cleveland two. 14-7. 10 nothing. 6 3. That's another baseball score. And 5 to nothing. And weird scores to this. Was that second inning or quarter? <laughs> and here is Higgs to the 49 yard line. Going to be third down and still a couple to go for the first down. Here the score is Miami 10 and Detroit 10. And Kofer will check back into the lineup. We're coming on the two minute warning will now be given to both pitches. And Dorothy Sheila is missed by all of her friends because she was truly an exceptional lady. And sometimes when uh, Don earlier in his career was very harsh with people, they always said that she was the diplomat and she would come in and smooth over the waters. You know, I thought one of the cute stories I had read in the sporting news this week was when they first got married. Yes. He did it. He did it by mail. But then the strange thing about it is when they get a chance to see his son Michael up in the booth. Which ties into your story. Yes, it does. And that is, is that he asked Dorothy to backpedal. And she says, well, backpedal? Why do I have to backpedal? He says, because I want to know what kind of football players my sons are going to be. <laughs> and of course, this boy right here, Mike Shula, did have a year with the Tampa Bay Bucs. And his other son, David, who now works as an offensive uh, coach for the Cincinnati Bengals, also had a year or two in the pros, I believe, with the Colts, was it not? I'm not sure. This is Will McDonough, O.J. Simpson. Keep you up to date with scores and highlights from around the league. And they do it in less than 30 minutes. Reno throws, and it is incomplete. He's going to his tight end, and Benny Blades knocked it away. Benny Blades is a person that they need to step up and to make big plays. They made him a first-round pick a couple of years ago, and they need him to be the Ronnie Lott, Joey Browner type of enforcer. Great coverage here. He almost makes a big play and is almost able to come up with it and go the distance. Good coverage on Farrell Edmonds. Benny Blades, a big safety along the lines of David Fulcher, about 220, 225 pounds, a real hitter. 
Reggie Roby's first punt of the ball game. Now he wears a watch during the ball game. I asked him about. I said, "Doesn't Shula get on you about wearing the watch?" He said, "Well, the first game I wore it, I kicked so well, he hasn't said a word." <laughs> Amazing how coaches are superstitious. If it works, don't mess with it. Mel Gray is the return man. Takes it at the seven and returns to. The 17-yard line. Now let's go to New York and an update. Here's Bob Costas. All right, Charlie, here are the Bengals backed up to their own goal line, and James Brooks can't get out of the end zone. Down he goes for the safety, and the Battle of Ohio begins to look on the scoreboard like a game between the Reds and the Indians. Cincinnati 3, Cleveland 2. Yeah, but we already mentioned that. I know, but he stole it from us. Yeah, I know. You know what, it's driving, it's driving him crazy not to do baseball. You know that it is. He does That's a good. big opportunity for him. And a big opportunity for Detroit in a tie ball game with 144 left in the first half as they go to work for their own 17. He has pressure, and he has dropped back at the nine-yard line. Brian Cox got him. That is the second sack for the Dolphins. Brian Cox has been spending a lot of time in the Detroit backfield right there. He just cuts inside of Lomas Brown and is able to make the play. Lomas Brown is involved with Jeff Cross, and that's part of the problem with a one-back offense. If you don't have somebody to that side to pick him up, he's going to come unencumbered, and that's what happened. And as well as Cox has been playing, it's amazing that he was taken in the fifth round. So a lot of, uh, a lot of ball clubs had a lot of opportunities. Well, we mentioned earlier Dallas and Philadelphia gave up on Higgs, so. <laughs> it's not an exact science, is it? Second and 17. He goes out and stops the clock. Wasn't going anywhere. The market at the 14-yard line. Now I wonder about that. If, if, you'd, if he'd have been a little bit smarter right there, he should have stayed in bounds because obviously they just want to run out the clock here. There's no position to score. Well, he might break a long one. And we're going to break a long one on NBC today, a doubleheader. Buffalo and the Jets, Indianapolis at the Raiders, Seattle at Denver. Those are the game schedule for the second half of the doubleheader and so in all probability our viewers here with us will then be joining one of those ball games. There is balcony. Oh what a great cut. I love to watch him run. He's out to the 22 <laughs> yard line. He just, he just sit back and look say here he comes. <laughs> Bobby Harden with the tackle. Charlie, let me tell you, the reason I mentioned that earlier is, you know, they come up now third and 13, and you knew that they were going to call the draw play, but earlier when Barry Sanders ran out of bounds, of course, that stopped the clock and saved the Dolphins a timeout. Here's the cut that you're talking about. Preston Pearson, when I was playing with the Cowboys, he used to refer to him as Sweet Feet. Now, what's this cut? That's just amazing. When Gail Sayers was playing, they said that he was... He was the 30-mile-an-hour car that had the 60-mile-an-hour speed and maneuverability. I mean, that, that's the way it is with Sanders as well. The cuts that he can make, he reminds me a little bit of Joe Washington, who used to play with Oklahoma, who used to make that cut. And like Joe Washington, if he wanted to, because those are the team colors, he could wear the silver shoes. And one thing that his teammates would like Barry to do is, I mean, we talked to some of his offensive linemen, they would like him to celebrate just a little bit more and and outwardly enjoy his numbers and his accomplishments. He's a he's a very low key, he's a very religious young man, but he, he, that, there's no showboat in him at all. I think they, this offensive line would like to have him just a little bit, so they could say, yeah, we're part of that. Well, as we get a chance to talk with him yesterday, we know that he is very conscientious of the fact that he wants to be among the elite. I mentioned the sport article to him where they mentioned that he was the top running back in the league, and he said, oh, really? That's great. Here is pressure. Arnold has the first down. see the end of this when he runs into Hugh Green. This is very funny. Now he's having an argument with Frank Gans as whether or not he did the right thing. A lot of times this is simply by feel. He thinks the thing's going to get blocked and so he takes off and of course everybody's in the return so he knows what he's going to do. Now watch when Hugh Green comes up. Now do I run into him or run out of bounds? What am I going to do? Oh my gosh! <laughs> he wanted no part of Hugh Green. It was a plan. It would have been blocked. No, it would have been blocked. This is a good reaction. Jim Arnold's been in the league 10 years. He knew that that was what was going to happen. But here, he's not going to make anybody forget Hugh Ritt Dixon with that forearm. <laughs> but now all of a sudden, pretty good field position in time. 
Pass far side is complete. And Robert Clark goes out of bounds, stops the clock. 37 seconds. And wouldn't it be amazing if Jim Arnold, with that 20-yard scamper, turns around the scoreboard at the end of the first half? Yeah, and wouldn't it even be more amazing if they made him second string behind Sanders? <laughs> <laughs> and also, remember earlier when he had that punt that went out at the five and then the penalty, and he got another good one off, but uh, it went out inside of the 20, about the 17-yard line. So he's made quite an impact yes, on this game. Second and short. Each pass is low. There was triple coverage on Perryman, and he was just throwing it down for the incompletion to stop the clock, and it will be third down. The offensive staff, Dave Levy in particular, has to realize that they have plenty, they have all of their timeouts, so they can still run Barry Sanders and use a timeout here. It's not as if they have to throw every down, even though they are at midfield. Well, of course, Arnold is your big weapon. If they don't pick up the first down, they can put him in again on four. <laughs> <laughs> And there is the man you were talking about. Levy also told us that uh, when he was talking about Mel Gray, we've got a timeout. That uh, he said Mel Gray is like a, a young colt. He said you don't know if he's going to run into the fence or not, and the gate could be wide open. You're not really sure what he's going to do, but he does have a lot of talent and is a premier return man. And here, by the way, is an opportunity for us to welcome to our NBC family our newest affiliate, WGBC TV, Channel 30, Meridian, Mississippi. And by the way, our producer today, Terry Ebert, is a native son of the great state of Mississippi. And so welcome, Terry, to all of his friends, and welcome to uh, WGBC. And don't forget to stay with us, including WGBC. Let him get the first out and then call timeout. And uh, this is exactly what they do here. Barry does pick up the first down. He turns, stops the clock, and that took seven seconds to 26 seconds time left. But now they could have had another timeout right there. I mean, they had to call timeout to go off guard. No, I don't think that was. That's what happens when you have a young quarterback. Sometimes he's a little indecisive, and he feels like he needs to come over and talk to the coaches and make a decision. But there, I think that Rodney had the savvy to do just what he did. Yesterday in practice, you were uh, you were playing a little uh, little catch with Rodney Pete, catching his passes. How does he throw the ball? What's it like to catch? Well, Rodney Pete, you know, has a big wind-up, and so he's, you know, he's got a good arm, a very good arm, but his ball is a little bit tough for me to catch. Why? Uh, because I'm old. <laughs> no. no. I, I think a broken fingers like Robert Clark. Well, I think one of the things that you learn as you get older is touch, you know, as opposed to Dan Marino, who's got the quick release, but he knows how to throw the ball, you know, in certain situations. And so even though he throws the ball hard, he has touch on it in certain situations, and his ball's a little bit easier to catch. Is Rodney Pete, is it a heavy ball to catch? Down. That one he had to throw hard simply to get it there in time. Clark, the intended receiver, and everybody on Miami is dropping back. What can you throw with this kind of a defensive coverage? Well, here you get a chance to see Clark run the corner out, but he runs right into the teeth of the coverage. They have, they're, they're going back into the zone. They have one guy trailing a Vesty Jackson. It looks from where Rodney is, is that it's man to man coverage, but in reality it isn't. It's a split zone. Jackson is, is just trailing him. And they have somebody back there to help out, and that's the reason why you look right there. His numbers aren't as good as they could be. Do you throw underneath the zone? Certainly. With, if you have one tight, if you have one timeout left, rather, you can throw him into the field. Get that 15 yards, call the timeout, set yourself up for a field goal. Or just as effectively, you can run Sanders. He goes to the 37-yard line, and they will take the timeout with 13 seconds. Bobby Harden makes the tackle. Now, do you throw once for the end zone? and then kick the field goal, or do you kick the field goal now? Well, you know, this is interesting. Everybody remembers the Super Bowl, and everybody remembers the problems there at the end by Scott Norwood. The natural hook of the sidewinder, you want it on the left hash as a result. And when Buffalo got down there to the 30-yard line, they had it on the right hash, and if you recall, the ball was pushed right. Now here, what they want to do is not only do they want to get an out route to the left side, but they want the ball to be on the left hash so Eddie Murray's natural hook will take it into the middle. I believe Eddie Murray's career longest is 54 yards, so that's about what it would be right here. But that's not exactly a gimme. I think they want to get a couple more yards to get closer in for Murray. And just as a footnote, Barry Sanders has rushed for 88 yards in the first half. And Mark Higgs has rushed for 57. And he also has a touchdown. Now, if 
they get the inside, the outside receiver can run it up, and the inside receiver running out, they might have a shot at this. Now he has to get out of bounds. And he does. Willie Green goes out at the 34-yard line. The only problem there is he's only able to gain three yards. And so now Eddie Murray's kick is going to be about a 51-yarder. It is within his range, but this is hardly automatic. And look who the holder is. Our famous guy. Jim Arnold, the putter and big play artist. You know, at the end of the game, we talk about big plays, and that one certainly is in contention at this point. Huh? Eric Sanders is the snapper. 51-yard field goal attempt for the lead at halftime. It is no good. It is no good from 51 yards away. So it is halftime, and we are tied. Silverdome, Miami and Detroit, and we are tied at 10. I'm Charlie Jones along with Todd Christensen. And a very good and exciting first half. Yeah, one of the rare occasions where you and I predicted something that actually happened. Both Higgs and Sanders have yeah. been terrific. You know, one with 50-plus yards, and I think Sanders has 88. It's been exciting to watch these two guys run. And all of Detroit is, uh, they are very pleased because they were afraid it might be a blowout. It is a long way from a blowout. And we'll go back and take a look at the scoring in the first half. Well, Mark Higgs, makes it, Mark Higgs makes a terrific cut here. It's supposed to be a sweep, and he cuts back to the middle. And, of course, if you'll see here as he lays the ball over the goal line, he gets a little bit of a gift. This is a touchdown. No, yeah, he breaks uh, well. All he's got to do is break right. the plane right there. Okay, he's going to give him that one. Now, no, Rodney, Pete, Rodney Pete is the one that really makes this play. Look at Green. He's just loafing. He's not even a part of things. He's looking around. Now he sees Pete's. Uh-oh. Look at this. I'm going to get me a gift touchdown. So he cuts to the back. Vesty Jackson isn't looking. He's able to reach over the top, and that's a touchdown. After dropping two passes, he very much needed that one. And in case you weren't with us at the beginning of the telecast, uh, we should remind everybody that Don Shula is going for a landmark victory should the Dolphins win today. This would be victory number 300 as a head coach. And that would leave him 25 short of George Hallis, and many people predict that by the middle of 1993, he is going to get yeah. that, and Don Shula is a very focused man, and I wouldn't doubt it for a minute. And when you ask him about it, he said, that's the one that he really wants, because that's the big one. Well, here we get a chance to look at the stats. You can see the rushing yards by Detroit is up on top. No turnovers, which is very nice, and if you add in the yardage in penalties, it's about even yardage-wise. Halftime stats presented by Coors Light. One of the things that I think is going to have to happen here in the second half is that the Dolphins are going to have to spend a little more time offensively on the field. Dan Marino's going to have to get a little bit more involved in getting a chance to throw the ball. And, of course, Higgs, a lot of his yardage came early in the first quarter. The second quarter really belonged to the, Dolphins, or the Detroit Lions. Rather. And so we're set for the kickoff of the second half. Don Shula, the head coach of the Miami Dolphins. Wayne Fox is the head coach of the Detroit Lions. And we are underway. Mark Logan bounces it, picks it up, and will down it in the end zone. And so Miami, with the first offensive opportunity of the second half, will start from the 20-yard line. We mentioned that he is celebrating his 30th birthday. Well, he's a very durable quarterback. This is very impressive. Of course, Randall Cunningham was a little bit closer to that prior to his going out with a knee injury, knee injury earlier. But this just goes to show, you know, Jim Everett, second place, 47. That's, in effect, three years' worth. That's not very long. And this just points out not only Dan Marino's durability, but the fact that a lot of coaches around the league have been telling me something that you really do now need two quarterbacks because of the fact that these guys do go down. come out with Higgs running to open the second half. Detroit has made some defensive adjustments. They'll pick up a yard to the 21. It's going to be second down and nine. Michael Kofer, along with Mark Spindler, makes the tackle for the Lions. You know, Mark Spindler was one that they anticipated was going to be drafted a little bit higher. I remember I had to be watching ESPN when it was one of those deals where he had the camera at his house, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting. You couldn't believe he lasted until the third round. Well, last year he had some problems with injuries and a few other things. But now they feel like he's going to be a major contributor to the defense. Was there a camera at your house doing the draft? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Newsreel. <laughs> Pass is complete over the middle to Tony Page. Page, the former Lion, is brought down by William White. 
Tony Page came with that forearm right under William White's chin, but it didn't bother him at all. He stuck right with him. This is a dimension that Page offers the Dolphins. As we mentioned, he is a terrific blocker, but even though he's not too tall, he is a pretty good pass catcher. Makes a pretty good move there on Spielman, gets open. There's that forearm, but White didn't back down. Sure a lot of guts by White, because Page tips the scales at about 2 4 0. A pickup of 13, first down Miami, their own 34 yard line. Opening drive, second half. Team is tied at 10. White through the hands of Farrell Edmonds. Now, Edmonds is a great athlete. Now, this is what Don Shula told us. And he is an awesome blocker. But hands, hands, not his strong point. Well, we showed that there. And also, but his hearing is good because he certainly heard the <laughs> footsteps of George Jameson. Oh, 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 you're, oh, you're tough today. You're <laughs> tough today. Marino now 10 of 16 and even 100 yards. Second and 10. Clayton wide to the near side. Looper to the far side. earlier Mike Cooper had a sack that was nullified by a penalty. We mentioned earlier that Richmond Webb, the left tackle for the Miami Dolphins, who's been out two games with an injury, that's where he comes over the top. Makes a move right there, a little swim move, he's able to get away. Spin Marino down for a big loss. Third and 23, Miami now goes to their four wide. Scott Miller, Tony Martin come in. Jensen is in the backfield. Three wide receivers near side, one to the far side. And Reno wants a timeout. And he may have been running out of time on the play clock. You know, I wonder in a situation... I wonder in a situation like that is you might as well, if you're third and 23, why not be third and 28? What difference does it make? Because you're going to have to punt. We'll be back. As we come back to the Silver Dome, this is the restaurant over the end zone. By the way, closed on Saturday. We tried to get in there. Yeah, we had to go to Ted's <laughs> instead. <laughs> third and 23. You're right. I'm surprised that Marino used up a timeout. They have to cut anyway this deep. And it is incomplete. He was going to Mark Clayton. And Marino took a shot. Once again, Mike Kofer makes him pay the price. He's looking around saying, what's going on? You guys got to protect me. Is this the same offensive line that was least in sacks last year? He actually buys some time here. He shows some pretty good feet. He told me yesterday, I know this isn't my strong suit, but I can evade the rush from time to time. So you can see Mike Kofer once again right on top of him. And Cooper's been in the Marino neighborhood all day. Well, you know, he's, it's very important to have him on the defense. As we mentioned, he's been the leading sack over the last few years. And he is their best pass rusher. And missing him in the first two weeks of the season, that really did hinder the defense of the Lions. Reggie Roby with his second punt. And oh, he my. nails this one. Mel Gray backs up and takes it at the 23-yard line. And returns to about the 35. Mel Gray told me yesterday that that's all instinct. You cannot relax when you're returning a punt. You can on a kick. As we come back, we check in with a Hurts 10-minute ticker. Chicago by 10 over the Giants. Washington shutting out Phoenix there in the third. And still that low-scoring battle. Cleveland 5, Cincinnati 3 there at halftime. San Francisco trailing Minnesota by 10 in the third. And Philadelphia out in front of Dallas, 17 to nothing. A tie right now in the third. New England and Pittsburgh. Green Bay in front of Tampa Bay, 5 to nothing. And here, with 12.30, time remaining in the third quarter, we are tied at 10-10. And Kerry Glenn being assisted from the field. He got him tried to limp off, and that wouldn't work, because it hurt too much. And we will try to have a report for you as soon as possible. Terry Glenn, one of the keys to their special teams, you can see right there, led the team in tackles last year, along with Jim Crash Jensen. The Lions now with Fortin as a tight end and Tunnell as a wingback. So they're in the power formation for Sanders to run. And he's kind of 
kind of slides around the corner and picks up a quick five, maybe six yards on the play. You know, I was hoping to get this done the first half, but now I have to ask him the second. I'm sorry, I can't quite tell from here. What's Derek Tunnell's number? Uh, I can't see. He's blocked right now. Oh, please. Come on, help me out. What's Derek Tunnell's number? Well, he's, number, he's wearing number 46, and he's a wing back. Thank you. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. Not a tight end. Just his number. I just wanted his number. Not a very popular number. There it is. Oh, I love it. Tight end with 46, man. He's a wing back. Oh, come on. He's a, tight, he's a tight end. The tight end is an offensive lineman. In the mouth of tight end. That's what they think of tight end. All right, here's Sanders to this side. Slips a tackle. He draws three and still picks up another three. And that's amazing. He, he made all those people miss, and he's gonna. He, that's one of the prettiest runs for no gain I've ever seen. The blocking breaks down right here. Jeff Cross and both Cox get in the backfield. Cox has him right here. Look at that. No, nope, not there. Now he sidesteps again, goes past Offerdahl. <laughs> man, oh, man. He is fun to watch. He gets cliche to say from broadcasters, but this man is worth the price of admission. Particularly for us. <laughs> we have told you. Third down and four. And it is incomplete. And it will be fourth down. And Detroit will get. Once again, Brian Cox and Jeff Cross in the backfield. Forcing Rodney Pete to run to his left and try and make a play. This young man's really making a name for himself today. He's spent an awful lot of time in that Lions backfield. Jim Arnold. Jim Arnold will be kicking his first kick. It was for 46 yards. The second time he was in pump formation, he ran for 21 in the big play of the first half. And Scott Miller is the return man for the Dolphins. You know, we talked to Don Shirley yesterday. He told us that Scott Miller had played so well that that had definitely influenced his decision Ooh, look to, at this. to trade his first-round pick. Oh, that's an awesome kick. Back to the eight-yard line. Up the sideline, and then out of bounds. That is a great kick. To further that story, they felt that he was going to be their new fifth receiver, and he looked good there making the punt return. 52 yards. This is Charlie Jones, Todd Christensen. You're looking at Dan Marino. Miami with the ball. They're on the 22-yard line. In a tie ball game, and Higgs picks up almost 10. Let's see where they mark it. He may have the first down. William White makes the tackle, and this will give him 68 yards in 14 carries. And again, should he go over 100 yards in this ball game, it will be a first for the Miami Dolphins for a running back to have three consecutive 100-yard games. And that's amazing when you look back at the great runners that they've had in the past. That was a nice job there by Harry Galbraith, pushing off not only in the nose guard, but coming off on Spielman, enabling Mark Hicks to cut behind him for 10. Taking about a half for the first down, and he picked up the first down at the 34-yard line. One of the things the Dolphins have done over the last couple of years is that it's been kind of a, a crapshoot with their first-round pick has been documented over the last couple of weeks. They traded their first-round pick this year, Randall Hill, for defensive help. They got a first-round pick from the Phoenix Cardinals. Last year, of course, Richmond Webb, terrific job as a tackle. Before that, Lewis Oliver and Sammy Smith, who have been competent players. Before that now, you take a look at John Bosa and Eric Kumro, people struggling to stay in the lead. Here is his left side. And he is out to the 37-yard line. They're x-raying the ankle of Kerry Glenn of the Dolphins that you saw being assisted off of the field, and it is doubtful that he will return. We do not have a report on the x-ray, and here is Michael Kofer, who is down. This is the second time in the ballgame that he has been down. And so we'll take a timeout. We are tied at 10, and we'll be... But Kofer, in pursuing the play, is going to get a helmet to the knee. Take a look at the bottom left of your screen. Take a look at his left knee right here and what's going to happen. Watch the helmet, and watch that left leg come flying back. Right there, you can see, ouch, that helmet right on the knee. And I know people are going to say, I know he's got knee pads. Is that going to protect him? But really, the pads are not that thick. And when you're coming as fast as you can and you get a helmet on that part of your anatomy, believe me, that is very painful. You can see right there that they're going to have to bring out the cart because Michael Kofer doesn't feel like he can walk on that left leg. Try and get a report a little bit later as to the condition of Michael Kofer. Let's check in with the early games around the league. Our Hertz 10-minute ticker. Chicago leading the Giants by 10. Uh, 
Phoenix, the upset king early this year. They're losing big to Washington. Cleveland, Cincinnati still very close. San Francisco trailing the Vikings by 10. And, that's and Philadelphia shutting out Dallas in the third. New England, Pittsburgh tied. Green Bay leading Tampa Bay by two, five to three. And here in the Silver Dome with 938 left to go in the third quarter. We are tied Miami 10 and Detroit 10. When was the last time? When was the last time you were broadcasting? And you remember? Yeah. Safeties as a score and not as a player. Yeah. Very seldom. Very seldom do you see one, much less two. I mentioned the early games as we looked at the Hertz 10-minute ticker. This is a doubleheader on NBC, and our late ball games: Buffalo against the Jets. The Buffalo, of course, uh, the one of the favorites to go to the Super Bowl. Indianapolis against the Raiders. The, the Raiders making some noise on the West Coast in Seattle at Denver in the Mile High City in a battle in the West and it is second and seven and Marino sheds tacklers you saw the rule change and then Spindler got him and that is the second sack of the ball game for the Lions but, but Tracy you saw that grasp and almost control and it would have been stopped last year I like the rule change I agree Tracy Hayworth is the one who comes no one touches him coming from the backside and once again you got to show the escapability of Marino. Nice job here, but there's absolutely nobody open. And Mark Spindler is able to pick up the garbage. Loss of seven. It'll be third down and 14 back at the 30-yard line. Here we have a great support team here in the booth. Michael Brenner, Chris Lango, and Bernie Riley. And I want to, usually we say that the last two minutes, but they are so good. I wanted to mention it early in the second half. Thank you, gentlemen. Great to be back in the Motor City. Marino off to Jensen and crash. Crashes at the 41. He gains 11. That's the good news. The bad news is he needed 14. Jamison got him. Lions hold. Dolphins will be kicking. Interesting point about Jim Jensen. You know, all those years he gets his reputation as a special teams player. Over the last three years, Jim Jensen has caught 163 passes. That's hardly somebody who is uh, in obscurity anymore. He is really a star player now for the Dolphins. And the Dolphins have a Jim Jensen cake for the flight back home. And I will tell you why a little later. Here is Roby with the kick. Chase back to the three-yard line, Mel Gray. And he'll return it to about the 17 or the 18-yard line. Gerald Edmonds makes the tackle. 55 yards of the kick, a 13-yard return. And Reggie Roby has a, a different style of kicking. And when we asked him about it yesterday, he said, my left foot never leaves the ground. It did in college. Not now. I get better height. Well, there's two reasons for it. One, as you mentioned, is the trajectory. By keeping his foot on the ground, he's able to get the ball up much higher. You can see right there, the left foot planted. It has a trajectory that goes up. Look at that extension. And the other reason, of course, is because he weighs 245 and he can't get it off the ground anyway. <laughs> and he was, yesterday, he was trying to hit the top of the Silver Dome, which is 202 feet high. And he came close, but he couldn't hit it. Reggie Roby is ninth on the all-time list of punters. Very impressive. Fortin is in as a tight end. Tanell is there as a wingback. And Sanders carry from the 19. And he's out to the 27-yard line. Louis Oliver makes the stop. 102 yards rushing now for Barry Sanders, his 18th carry. And we have 7.42 and counting time remaining third quarter. You know, it's interesting. I like what they're doing offensively. You know, last series they went with the tight end and the wing back. And maybe they're content now to give Barry Sanders the ball and see what they can do, not only of taking some time off the clock, but letting Barry Sanders do what he does best. You know, last year they had a coach by the name of Charlie Sanders, one of the all-time great tight ends, but there was no tight ends for him to coach. Now he coaches the receivers, and I had a chance to chat with him yesterday. Terrific guy, Charlie Sanders. Seven-time Pro Bowler. Your idol? Well, he's certainly one of the guys that I have great respect for. I wanted to be, in fact, that's one of the reasons that I kept playing the next few years, because I wanted to take a shot at his record of seven Pro Bowls, and I told him so, and he said, nah, you weren't going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, second from the right, right next to Ray Barry. You can see him there on the headset. Number 88, what a terrific player he was for the Detroit Lions in the 70s. He also told me one of the differences of the players today. He says money certainly has an effect. He said the camaraderie is not the same. He says we were dumb. We didn't know any better. We played for the love of the game. Report on Michael Kofer's sprained left knee. Play action fake by Rodney. 
Far side pass is complete. Robert Clark. And the Lions are cranking up their offense. Boy, that was really a nice route. Now, take a look at his right foot if he get a chance to on the replay. This is awfully close. He runs the comeback route. It's the same route he ran earlier. As the man turned around, take a look at his right foot. Does his right foot get down in time? There's the left. Now take a look at the right. Is it? Both toes. Oh, boy. That's awfully close. Is it enough to overrule? I don't know. Is, is it enough to take a look? Well, they're in a hurry. Take a look at the right foot. Left, you know, is down. Where's the right foot? Is it on the white? Ah, oh, no, it's good. He's uh, got it. Awfully close. Easy call. Boy, okay. They're not reviewing it. No. Here good we for go. the Lions. First down, 45. Feet up the middle. He made, he made a Barry Sanders move with his feet, but his body did not follow. <laughs> one, of my favorite, one of my favorite lines, Lynn Swan said it one time, and I got a big charge out of it. He said, he knew it was time for me to get out. He says, well, my mind wrote checks that my body couldn't cash. Now, Rodney's a long way from being done, but you're right. Right here, he's thinking way too many moves, and at the last minute, he says, man, I'm going down. At the Miami 45, first down, disdaining the slide. Rodney Pete last week had a career high in completions against the Green Bay Packers with 25. He is 7 of 14 for 91 yards in this ballgame and has a first down rushing at the Miami 45. And here is Sanders to the 41. In a four, second down and six. Brian Soche, who just came uh, to the Dolphins very recently, activated for the ballgame. Is in on the play? You know, a lot of people feel with the four wide receiver set again, whatever you want to call it, red gun, stretch, uh, run and shoot, run and throw, chuck and duck. I mean, whatever the name for chuck it is. Chuck and duck? Yeah, Buddy Ryan had that I, name for it. They think that you can't contain the ball. Interestingly enough, is we, you know, we've had Houston on a number of broadcasts. They led the AFC last year in time of possession with the run and shoot. Second down. Play action, a pump fake, and then this is thrown away, and a flag is down. Flag dropped around the 29 of the 30-yard line. And it floated about eight yards through the air. With the green, the closest receiver for the Lions, but uh, Pete was throwing it away. Lewis Oliver screaming about something. He thinks it should be against the Lions, and it is. Offensive pass interference against Detroit. He's pointing it out. He insisted. He, he sprinted right over and made sure that they made the right call. He got pushed. We mentioned it, but it is now official on Michael Kofer's sprained left knee and uh, probably will not return. Interference, number 86 on the offense. That's 10 yards, repeat second down. That's on Willie Green. I mentioned that number 70, Brian Soche, was in on that last play. Brian Soche is an excellent nose tackle. Here he's playing some defensive end, comes up field, and he's going to pursue all out. You know, he's been rested, as we mentioned. He hasn't had a chance to, you know, for two weeks, he's been holding out. He had an interesting thing. He was so upset with management in the first week, he claimed that he was going to come back away from him at the airport with his face painted blue and red. Here's Mike Barr. And another flag is down. Maybe a face mask, it is. They'll tack it on to the end of the play. Those fans who have followed Detroit football for a very long time would know that the surname is very familiar. Mike Farr, the son of Mel Farr, the great running back of the Detroit Lions during the late 60s and early 70s. And I think it's also very interesting that you'd have an SC quarterback throwing to a UCLA wide receiver. As long as they complete it. And as long as they get paid, right? <laughs> Money gets in the way of that college face fraternity. Mask, number 26 on the defense. It was a 15-yard gain, short of the first down, but the penalty of five took him to the first down. There's a little bit. Uh, See, that wasn't much. It was incidental, but it did bend his neck just enough for them to throw the flag. Jarvis Williams on the infraction. So the ball goes to the 31-yard line, first down. everywhere. The ball start on Eric Sanders, the right tackle.
former Falcon player Eric Sanders moves just a little bit. A little anxious. The crowd doesn't seem to mind, though, as you can hear them getting excited about this drive that Detroit's putting together. Is it easy to forget a snap count? Which is what he did. Not if you can count to three. So, <laughs> well, I was trying to get him a way out. You slammed the door on him. Okay. <laughs> well, you're right. I am rough today. <laughs> Pass is complete to the rookie Herman Moore. This is their first round pick. They said, boy, this guy's great. We need to see what he did. The reason he's so excited about it is because he really couldn't. He couldn't see before. Everything was blurry to him. Now he cuts up the video. I mean, this is an eight-yard game. Maybe it's not that big a deal. Stand and play, just a hook. Cuts up the field. Now watch his reaction after he catches the ball. He gets up. Boy, is he excited. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, right. Sanders. First down out of bounds. 56 time remaining in the third and Detroit is taking a hold of the ball game. We are tied at 10 but the Lions are driving. They've been running a lot to the left side. Lomas Brown was telling us yesterday that he got frustrated by the fact they've been running almost exclusively to the right side. Now they've been running a lot to the left side, and Barry Sanders is 116 yards, and our guy Lomas Brown must be very happy about that. Because he said yesterday, I don't understand why they're running the right side. If they keep running the right side and not over me, I'm going to wait one more game, then I'm going to talk to him. Well, now he doesn't have to talk to him. have to talk to him. Lomas Brown, a pro bowler last year, also making Todd's turret. My all pro team. It might be getting old for us to say that this man is something special. Take a look at the stiff arm and then take a look at the moves right here. Cuts up. Jarvis Williams, a tough tackler, stiff arms him, cuts back, stiff arms again, able to get the extra yardage. So many times, you know, strong things do come in small packages. You know, some of the best bench pressers and squatters are short people. And my guess is that man right there bench presses a little over 400 pounds and squats around 650. He is something else. We've got a timeout, and Barry Sanders told us that the ultimate team challenge is to win the ball game, not statistics. Well, you're right. You know, two years ago, he had a chance to lead the league in rushing. At the end of the season, they're playing Atlanta. There's a minute left, and the Chiefs had already played, so they knew that all he needed was 10 yards. And he said to us yesterday, he says, well, you know, Todd, I was kind of cold, and I didn't feel like going back out there. And I said, what are you talking about, for a rushing title? But that's exactly what he said. He said, this was more important to me. We had already gotten the job done. And a young man that has been running with the football since he was in the fourth grade. Well, that, and, and that's certainly what he knows best. I thought it was interesting, you know, we talk about his humility and everything else, but the truth was is that when I asked him about the other running backs around the league and I asked him about yards and things of that nature, he says, yes, he says, I am concerned with that, but it's very private to me. I don't let everybody else know my business. And his Heisman Trophy on the mantle at his dad's house in yeah. Wichita, Kansas. Very proud of that, and well, he should be. Reminds me of Elvis. Remember Elvis used to have that thing, TCB, taking care of business? That's Barry. things here you know Detroit is not used to having a three tight end set you know all their wide receivers now are off the field they're on the three yard line and they're pretty much telling everybody we're going to run the ball offered all is able to knife in get past the pulling guard and make a terrific play on Sanders John offered a five-time pro bowler and he's the only linebacker in the history of the Miami Dolphins to be picked to start in the pro bowl and I mentioned that but he and his wife have a bagel business in Miami so don't talk about that Let's talk about the football Back. 
Now, that was interesting. That was Tracy Hayworth. He's the one that comes in as the third tight end. He's obviously not used to catching the ball because he's a linebacker. You're going to hit, you're going to see it's hit him between the two nines. Oh, you got to oh, catch the left that nine. You got to hit him better than that. <laughs> oh, man. You can see the way his hands were backward that he's not used to catching the ball. And look at Rodney's reaction. He kind of smiles and says, well, this guy's not a pass catcher. But you were open. That's right. <laughs> you should have thrown it between the four and the six, but he wasn't open. <laughs> All right, third down goal. Ball game tied at 10. 106 left of the third. Now they're going back to their four wide receiver set. He can run it in. It's there. He's got it. Now it just happened. It, it just happened there that Rodney Pete, after he scores the touchdown, goes up into the stands, slap hands, and two officials threw the flag for a penalty on the kickoff. I'm sorry. There's just no way that you should be legislating against enthusiasm. It's a bootleg here. Everybody follows Barry Sanders on his hip. You can see Mike Farr is open for a minute, but once they make the decision to run with Mike Farr, as Vesty Jackson does, turns his back, that means Rodney Pete's going to run for it, and he has the touchdown. Now, isn't the whole idea of the fans to be a part of the game, to get a chance to be close to a star like Rodney Pete and touch his hand, and that should cost a five-yard penalty? I don't think so. I'm they, sorry. they got to change that rule. They've talked about it on NFL Live. We've talked about it. We saw it last week with Jerry Rice. Same situation up in the stands. Bad rule. Could be changed. Extra point. Let's go. Now, is this a display? Is this too much, do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Is this kind of being excited a little bit, trying to get your crowd fired up? Is this part of football? I think it is. Should that be penalized? I think not. But it is. It's foolish. Write your local congressman. <laughs> and it's a... No, I'm not sure if there's a... Is there a fine? No, there's not a fine on there. The fine is for throwing a football in the crowd. That's a $1,000 fine. Eddie Murray will kick off with Logan and Craver, the deep backs on the return. Craver to the 15-20 and returns to around the 28-yard line. In the second half, Dan Marino has completed one of four passes for 11 yards. He has been sacked twice, a loss of 20. Well, it's not as if they've had the ball a lot either. He hasn't had a lot of opportunity. Detroit leads it 17 to 10. Officially, they'll mark it the 29-yard line. If it's past the yard marker, past the hash mark, officially it is marked at the next spot, at the next yard line. Greg Beatty is the tight end for Miami. Reno throws deep over the middle, first down, as he goes to Mark Duper. Benny Blades had the coverage. They'll spot it at the 46-yard line. Duper and Clayton have been together for a very long, very long time. It's an in route over the middle, finds the seam. Still have to respect that speed. You know, they were known as the Marks brothers or Marks of Excellence, but now that they're both both on the south side of 30. Many wonder if they can still do the things they did in the past with both Coach Shula and the players. Said the man. Hey, man. Yes, we can. And they just picked up a quick 18. Here is Higgs, and he is down. As we start the fourth quarter, Miami trails by seven. Don Shula in quest of victory number 300 as a head coach in the National Football League. Had an interesting conversation with him yesterday. I asked him, what's the best and the worst things that have happened to you since you've been in the NFL? Reno's pass is knocked away. Good defensive play. Beatty, the intended receiver, and William White made the play. And what he said to us was that he said the worst thing is all the injuries. He says the players are so big and fast now and all the collisions. He's seen too many injuries that have shortened the careers of people that he wanted to have careers in the National Football League. But he said the best thing, and that's the thing that keeps him going, is the game. And I asked him about, oh, what do you, you know, the computerized thing and the fact that everything's on artificial turf and there's way too many coaches. He says, Todd, he said, the players still play, and that's the essence of the game. That's still what keeps me going.
Marino, first down. Scott Miller, the rookie from UCLA, tackled by Alexander. Gain of 12, first down. What a big catch for the youngster. Third down play, big play. Comes down, got man-to-man -man coverage, leans in, pushes off just a little bit, but he gets away with it. It's like Raymond Chester used to tell me, it ain't illegal if you get away with it. And that was a big play for the Dolphins right there. They really needed that first down to get the crowd out of it. When we asked Don Shula his best memory, he said, no question, 1972, the perfect season, 17-0. He said, that justified me as a head coach. Check in with the Fram 10 minute ticker. And we're checking in with the Fram 10 minute ticker. There it is. Hi. Brought to you by Fram. Ooh, look at the Giants. They pull within three of Chicago. Washington's still big in front of Phoenix. And Cleveland now in front of Cincinnati 11 to 3. Minnesota still by 10 of the 49ers. Philadelphia shutting out Dallas. Pittsburgh 13, New England 6. 5-3 green over Tampa and the Bays here it is Detroit 17 and Miami 10. Reno right side goes back to Page and they'll spot it at the 30 yard line which is going to be very close to the first down. Charlie the Detroit Lions came with a blitz there and that left Spielman man for man in coverage on Tony Page. The offensive line the interior did a good job of picking up the blitzing backers. And Marino was able to find Page in the flat. You asked Spielman yesterday about coming out on certain passing downs or coming out on third down. He said, if I've got to come out of the ballgame a lot, they're going to hang me from the top of the dome. Yeah, that's one guy that likes to play constantly. He also told us that he was disappointed that, you know, at the beginning of the season, they went with a 4-3, but it just didn't work. He's an inside backer who very much wants to be in that 4-3. And as we mentioned, very, very intense as you take a look at his eyes. Here's an update on the 10-minute ticker. The Giants now in front of Chicago, 17-13. Reno goes deep, and it is incomplete defensive play by Mark Clayton. Saved the interception. Good coverage there by Melvin Jenkins coming back. He was not fooled by the corner route, and he had Clayton all by himself. But look what Clayton does. Well, you can see this is actually a good job by Jenkins anticipating the ball. He comes down, and Clayton, you're right, does strip his arms just a little bit to make sure that he can't hold on. Reno with 12 completions out of 21 attempts has thrown to eight different receivers. Duper with three catches, Clayton with two, tight end Edmonds with two, Page with two, Banks, Martin, Jensen, and Miller all with one, so he has spread it around. I'm interested what the argument is as to whether or not they, you know, if they're thinking about whether or not it was a catch. I don't think there's any discussion here. No, it's being reviewed. Incomplete pass. The play is being reviewed. Marino can't believe it. He comes over to argue the point. You know, I think that they would have anticipated what are they coming to this. Well, they, they think that he might have had his, he might have had possession of the ball That's prior to going out of bounds, but he did. It's not even close. No. no. Well, well, close never had I think that Marino anticipated having a little bit easier day. Coming into this game, the Detroit Lions were giving up 73% completion percentage. I mean, that was the highest in the league by far. But they have really accredited themselves today. They're doing a good job in the second half. Second and Jim. Incomplete. Higgs, the intended receiver. And it was over his head. It may have been outside to Tony Martin, but it didn't get there either. It'll be third down. And that means that Jim Jensen will come in. I mentioned they had a all-purpose cake, the Jim Jensen cake on the plane ride home. Now, the reason for that is they've got three and a lot of zeros. Uh, 30, of course, for... Dan Marino's 30th birthday. If Higgs goes over 100 yards, a three would be for his third 100-yard game, and 300 would be for Don Shula. So they've got everything covered <laughs> on one cake. And they call it the all-purpose Jensen cake. Laid out, and it is incomplete. Was there a misread by a receiver? That's exactly what happened. You can see by Marino's reaction. He gets up and he's very disgusted. He said, he said, when the free safety leaves the middle of the field, he's got to go to the post. And that's what Marino is telling him right now. 
Boy, Marino really took a shot here. He's looking down the field. You're going to see Kevin Pritchett just lay him out. Bang. Throw him down. Now, that bad. now that was, no, no. When he threw him down there, he, the ball was already gone. Now, that is one that was very close that possibly could have been considered roughing the passer. But he's very upset with his receiver for not seeing that the free safety was gone. He's got to go to the post in that instance. 47-yard field goal attempt by Stojanovic. With all of his friends looking on, will it make it? Pete Stojanovic has two of the longest field goals in history, 58 and 59. But evidently the layoff has hurt his strength a little bit, but it still counts as three points, 17-13. Once again, we come back to the Silver Dome and another look. Those who, field goal attempt. those who remember last year, the playoff game between Kansas City and Miami, remember that Stojanovic hit a monster 58-yard field goal. This is about 10 yards short, but still it hits the crossbar and goes over, and there are about 500 people that cheered like crazy. <laughs> He's not sure, but he knows he didn't get all of it. 47 yards, 3 inches, that's all that he needed. That, that's all, it still counts. Mel Gray is the return man, and... Miami's done a pretty good job containing him to 18 yards on one kickoff return, 17 on the other. And this time he'll return it to the 20 yard line, maybe the 21, and has about 23 yards on the return. Give him 22 officially. Mike Iquinello played his collegian ball nearby at Michigan State. Made the tackle. I was wondering if we're going to go the whole broadcast without you having to say that name. Great name. Mike Winello, second yeah, I like time it. I like it. Detroit now leading 17-13 with 12:41 time remaining in the ball game. With the ball on their own 20-yard line, first down. Sanders 111 yards rushing. This is the 12th time in his career he's been over the 100-yard mark. 22 carries. Pete has completed 10 of 18 for 134 and a touchdown. Here's Sanders. Pitch move. First down. 34 yard line. Oh no. Jarvis Williams has just got to feel foolish. I mean, that is one of those where you go, well, okay, where did, where did my job go? I got completely faked out of it. Barry Sanders once again cuts back against the grain, showing that 4-4 speed. Obviously designed to go to the left. Here he cuts back. Now watch number 26 come out and have a free shot at him. Watch this. Watch him make it. Oh, goodbye. Terrific move. You know, the Miami defense has got to feel a little bit beleaguered, particularly their run defense. In the first week of the season against Buffalo, they get Thurman Thomas. Second week of the season against Indianapolis, they get Dickerson. Now they have to go against Barry Sanders. Boy, that's tough. At 14 yards, his longest run of the day. Jarvis Williams finally contains him, but he gets back to the line of scrimmage. It'll be second down. For Jarvis, that was a little payback <laughs> for the play before. Probably got up and took a look at his arm and said, oh, yeah, I do got it. All right. Detroit, of course, will be content now to take a little time off the clock. They, like so many teams, when they go against Miami, want to keep Miami's offense off of the field to give Marino as few opportunities as possible. Sabre Jackson now in as the running back in this set of second and ten as Sanders comes out for a brief. Go, go, go. He throws on the run. It is caught, but out of bounds. Robert Clark. It'll be third down. Well, the Dolphins have actually been doing a good job generating a pass rush to make Rodney Pete go out of the pocket. But on the touchdown and a couple of the other big plays, he's been able to come through spontaneously in plays that are not necessarily designed. You can see Tom Olivadotti sending in the defensive signals, big third and ten play for his Dolphin defense. Eleven minutes left in the game. complete to Perryman but again a marker is at the 49 yard line Chris Green the rookie from Illinois they're gonna have the coverage they're gonna have Bestie Jackson for defensive holding but they'll let it go because of the play by Perryman a gain of 18 it appeared that he had a hook and go and once he fooled him on the hook route Bestie just decided to reach out and grab him you can see right there he's not arguing the point 
Better to give up five yards and 50. Once again, getting flushed out of the pocket is Pete. But he does a nice job going to his right. Of course, it's much easier when you're a right-handed quarterback. And Perryman runs with him, which is key for the receiver. Makes a nice catch, gets the first down. And the call was on Jarvis and refused, just as you said it would be. The ball spotted at the Miami 48-yard line, first down. stop and go move. Just as you mentioned the time factor, it's interesting. Rodney Pete does come up to the line of scrimmage. You can see him hesitating, taking that extra five, ten seconds to call the plays. Gain of four, second and six, moving on the ten-minute mark. Time remaining. Now the Detroit Lions going with their tight end package. Fortin and Tennell come in, which would indicate to the Dolphins, I'm sure Tom Olivadotti knows the same thing, that they're going to be running the ball now. You like their tight end package? Well, you know, I like the potential of it. Let me put it that way. It's obviously something that's new to them. You know, these people are not accustomed to, to running in this particular set yet, but certainly with a runner like Sanders, you've got to figure that it's going to be effective down the road. Sanders to the 40. Gain of four. It'll be third down. Still a couple ago. His helmet kind of snuck through. Oglesby got him. Check in now with the 10-minute ticker. Chicago's now back in front of the Giants. That's become a seesaw battle. Bears by three. Washington big, big, big over Phoenix. And Cleveland now by one over Cincinnati. That one stays close. San Francisco closing on Minnesota. And the Eagles still shutting out the Cowboys in the fourth. New England trails Pittsburgh and Tampa Bay trails Green Bay. And here Detroit 17. Miami 13. Moving on the nine-minute mark of time remaining. Charlie, I was about to say, you know, they go in with a three tight end offense. That's the second time they've run the exact same play and been stuffed for a loss. That's obviously an offense that they're just not accustomed to just yet, and it's hurt them twice now. Remember, though, when they told us about that offense, they said we have only one play out of this offense, and we call it crunch. Well, that's what it is, but evidently the Dolphins are not fooled. When you put all your tight ends to one side and then you pitch out, they know where it's going. The Dolphins aren't stupid, and they stuff it for a loss. Or down Jim Arnold to kick. Scott Miller and Jarvis Williams are both back as returners. And Arnold working some time off of the clock, and he hangs this one up. Fair catch is called for and taken by Jarvis Williams at around the 17-yard line. 17 compromising quality. And by Right Guard Sports Stick. Anything less would be uncivilized. When we talked to Don Shula about his memories as he looked back, he said, when I was here at Detroit as defensive coordinator, the one that I remember is when we blew out Green Bay on Thanksgiving Day and when the offense came on the field, our offense, that means Detroit, said they were booed. They wanted the Detroit defense on the field. We were playing so well. Mike Clayton, as now the Miami offense goes to work. You know, it's interesting that particular, that he mentioned that that was the year that the Green Bay Packers went 13-1 and won, and won the NFL championship. So, ironically enough, had he not beaten them then, maybe that would have been another team with a perfect record. Dennis Gibson is the injured player. And we've got a timeout, so we'll step aside. Talk a lot about Don Shula going for win number 300, but what about this man, Wayne Fonts, head coach of the Detroit Lions? His record is 16 and 23, and believe me, he wants it just as much as Shula does. First down, Miami, 30 yard line. We know wobbly pass. He slip out of his hand. That's not like him at all. Well. No, it just didn't come out right. Yeah, but he had Mark Clayton running it up, and he was throwing to a quick, which is where you take five steps and turn around. There was obviously some miscommunication there. The wide receiver looks at the cornerback and what coverage he is in. If he is in what's called press coverage, which means he's up on top, he's going to go. You can see the signal that he just gave right there by tapping on his wrist, which meant I thought I was going to go deep, and obviously Marino read it differently. Of course, it could be with the dark glasses. He didn't see the cornerback that clearly. In 
incomplete. Tony Page, and he should have had it. It'll be third down. Spielman was there with him, number 54. And again, when you talk, we'll take another look at the replay. Well, he's wide open. Marino puts it right in there. He's able to beat Spielman, but it hits him right in the chest, and again, he drops it. Frustrating, and Tony knows. I told you, Spielman asked you the word for his wife to take home, and the word was, you told us earlier. Obsequious. Good. Well, I, what does it mean? I forgot this means fond of her. Okay. The way you are. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This coming from the ultimate <laughs> company. Give me a break. I asked for that. to Clayton and that is an unbelievable pass by Marino and a great catch too Ooh. you know all pro players make all pro plays and both guys did that right there Dan Marino is under the rush the crowd is cheering they got they, they force him out of the pocket moves to his left he throws the ball a little bit low but Clayton goes down and is able to catch oh. it actually very good coverage by Melvin Jenkins yes just oh, yeah. an all pro play and Marino put it the only place you've heard that time and time again but the only place that Clayton could catch it and the defender could not get to it Boy, save that one. Mark that one down. First down. Tony Martin is in. That was a third and ten conversion. And Higgs is stuck. That is his 18th carry in the ball game. He has now rushed for 74 yards. Jamison and Spielman were there to greet him. And greet him indeed. Boy, they really stuck him in the hole. The success that he was having earlier in the first half is not there. There you take a look at Chris Spielman. This man averages 8.8 .8 tackles a game. He holds the club record for 153. This man has a nose for the football from Massillon, Ohio, where I guess they do play a little football there, huh? They really do. Second and ten. Miami trails by four, 17-13, moving on the six-minute mark time remaining. Reno all the time in the world, and it's incomplete. He goes to Duper, and that was taking a chance. A couple of defenders in the territory, and Jenkins was going for the interception. It will be third down and 10, as it was a moment ago. Melvin Jenkins is doing an outstanding job on whoever happens to be on his side. He's trailing Duper. He thinks he's going to come back right behind him. Actually, he was very lucky there that he wasn't going up, but that's what happens. He knew he wasn't going up. He comes back for the comeback, and Melvin Jenkins is right there. The former Seattle Seahawks is playing a terrific game today for the Lions. Third and ten. you can see that he was a little disgusted because he thought there was a little bit of bumping down field by Ray Crockett but not the case fourth down to the Dolphins low snap probably a line drive past the coverage by about 10 yards and here is Mel Gray Mark Logan was down 13 yards in the return of 54-yard kick, but Roby had it low and not high, so the coverage couldn't get down. Now, the coverage still did a pretty good job, though, if you figure. What did you say, 55? 54? 55? 54. 54 and a 13-yard return. That's still a 41-yard net, and that's outstanding. NBC's premiere week begins tonight with four new shows and a network premiere movie. We'll start it all with the adventures of Mark and Brian, and that is followed by Erie, Indiana. Man of the People, Pacific Station, and Problem Child. So a great lineup tonight. Stay with us on NBC, our premiere one. And Pete comes out throwing. The pass is complete to Robert Clark. And he's brought down by Michael Magruder. I like this play calling by Dave Levy. I really do. You know, you figure right here they're going to do what? Ah, oh, they're going to hand off to Sanders, run some time off the clock. Surprise him a little bit with a very safe pass, and the clock is still running. Dave Levy, of course, was what? Excuse me, Dave Levy, 
was one of the people who was very responsible for the San Diego offense. He was there under Coriel from 1980 to 1988. Did an outstanding job there. And of course, we know they could throw the ball during that tenure. And enjoy doing it. Yes, he does. Second and three. by Vesty Jackson and it is incomplete. You know, it's interesting Rodney's reaction he kind of smiles. What can you do? You know Willie Green did have the touchdown but that's his third drop of the day and earlier he also had an offensive interference call. Again it's a little bit behind him but still this is very catchable. You got to catch this ball. The coverage isn't that tough. He does make a good Vesty Jackson does a nice job getting his hand on the ball but once it's in your chest that's got to be in there. You got to hang on to that ball. And not only the problem if it's not a first down, but now that also stops the clock, which certainly helps the Dolphins. That is third down and three. Lions lead 17-13, 4.51 left. going to see number 42 green excuse me that was Bessie Jackson I'm sorry I'm dyslexic he's the one that comes up gets a piece of it and Sean Lee catches the ball up in the air Rodney Pete was not over to get there quick enough to knock it away a la Joe Theismann in the 83 Super Bowl Bessie Jackson on the cornerback blitz comes right in his face gets a piece of it right there now Pete should run over the right there and try to knock it loose but he's not quick enough and Lee is able to make the catch Remember the play that I was talking about in the 83 Super Bowl when yep. Kim Bocamper was almost able to make that catch and Theismann strips him and that turned out to be a big play. Instead, it's a huge play for the Dolphins who now sit there knocking at the door. And the first turnover of the ball game. Exactly what Detroit wanted to avoid. They have played a picture book game for them as far as they wanted to play up to this point. And now a big play by the Dolphin defense. And they're still working on Sean Lee with the interception. Besty Jackson, who came over in the trade from the Chicago Bears for Eric Kumaro, has done an outstanding job. I was talking to Don Shula earlier about the fact that, you know, he took J.B. Brown's place when he was holding out. Comes on this corner blitz, jumps at the right time, the ball goes up in the air. That's a big play for them. Besty Jackson had done, actually done a very good job with the Chicago Bears, but they felt as if that they needed a pass rush and felt that Kumaro coming back to his hometown with the Bears would be effective with them. But now he's out for the season with an Achilles tendon injury, and there's Bessie Jackson starting corner playing very well for the Miami Dolphins. And also, Brett Perryman of Detroit saved the touchdown. He jumped on the back of Sean Lee and finally was able to bring him down, but uh, he still carried him for four or five yards. This telecast is presented by authority of the National Football League intended for the private use of our audience, and he rebroadcast or the use of this telecast without the express written consent of the Detroit Lions and the National Football League is prohibited. This game is the property of the National Football League, Miami Dolphins, and Detroit Lions, all rights reserved. Now for an update, let's go to New York City and Bob Costas. Bob? Thank you. Charlie, this is the sort of thing that has Yale Larry and Ray Guy recoiling in horror. Brian Wagner to punt for New England. It hits his own teammate, Marvin Allen, in the seat of the pants. And a grateful Ernie Mills recovers for Pittsburgh in the end zone. Not what you would call classic punting style. Pittsburgh 20, New England 6, two minutes left. And now the card has come out for Sean Lee. It looked like it happened near the end of the play. As you mentioned, Brett Perriman jumped on top of him. And I think that in the scramble, his knee... You know, his knee folded underneath. You know, this is, you know, AstroTurf was tough on knees, as we've mentioned before. There he has the ball. Take a look at the left knee now. Perriman jumps on top. Now, as other people come in, you can see he, he falls down. Kind of falls, right there. Oh, falls falls down. Ooh, is it ankle? It's the left, yes. Yes, the left ankle. You saw it cut. And yesterday, when we were walking around, and it's true on all the, all the uh, AstroTurf, and I, you forget about it, but if you've got on rubber sole shoes, 
it's like Velcro. I mean, it grabs the bottom for that moment, and you know, and the body keeps moving. And I, I feel confident that's exactly what happened, as we saw in the replay. It's interesting. I was reading, I was reading a quote by Jim Kelly. He was talking earlier this week about the new turf up in Buffalo. He said the grip was so good now that most of the people now just go to plain tennis shoes for that very reason. Of course, you remember he had sprained his ankle earlier in the season. Miami first down goal to go just outside the three yard line. Jensen's in motion pass is incomplete. Low and behind Craver. And I'm not sure what Marino's read on that was. That was a strange call, or strange execution of the call. You know, even though we talk about this is his 30th birthday, I think that, you know, the pass rush of the Lions really has gotten into him a little bit. You know, he threw that ball much too soon. Craver never even turned around. He threw it at his feet. I wonder if this is also an admission by the Dolphins that maybe they don't feel as if that they can run it in from the three-yard line by throwing on first down. Maybe an admission that was a great birthday party, that surprise birthday party his wife threw for him a few nights ago. Now you can see both tight ends flexing out, both Jensen and Beatty, Beatty in motion. Tony Page, he stopped. I think it's safe to say we're coming up to a very huge third down. Chris Spielman makes a play for Detroit. Two-yard line. Seventeen thirteen. Don Shula going for victory number three hundred to pull him within twenty five of the legendary George Hallis, become only the second man in the history of the National Football League to have three hundred or more victories. Third down, goal to go. chance to see earlier was that Mark Higgs came in right at the last minute to take Aaron Craver's place. They were already lined up, and so Craver told him what the play was, but he obviously wasn't set, and so as a result, he heads in. He gets tackled for the loss, and now the Miami Dolphins are not going to go for the field goal. They're going for it on fourth down. slam pattern. Dan Marino takes the step back. He's got him. Watch him lunge at the last minute. Make the play. Ray Crockett extends himself. That's the pass away. Terrific. And the place goes crazy. Now you can see Shula's reaction here. I know that maybe this is this is blasphemous to second guess a man who has 300 coaching victories, but there was more than three minutes left on the clock. He could have kicked the field goal, used his timeouts, and come back and kicked another one. He might regret this decision by the time this game is over with. Sanders carried flag down. I will agree with one thing. He said he's going for 300. He has 299 victories. Excuse me. I meant, I meant heading I for his 300th victory. You, you, you know, you figure there, Charlie, in that situation, I realize that, you know, you feel like you've been defeated there. You know, you've gone three plays and nothing has happened as we see a holding penalty, which I assume that they will probably refuse because they don't want to give him another down, right. and it's only going to be half the distance of the goal anyway. But if you kick the field goal with three minutes left, even with Barry Sanders, you've got to say to yourself, number 46, 
on Derek Tunnell. I agree with you. I agree with you. I figured he kicked the field goal, didn't count on the defense, give him one more shot, let Marino get him within field goal distance and go for the victory at the end. But then again, you, all, you know, in, in retrospect, you also have to be thinking that Don Shula is saying to himself, look, we haven't stopped Barry Sanders all day. Maybe this is our last opportunity. Good point. Sanders has rushed for 132 yards. 28 carries to this point. 29. Ogilvy with the tackle. The reason that I like to kick the field goal in this situation as well is because here Miami is going to use one of its timeouts is because you put the onus on a very young offensive team. Yes, Barry Sanders is tough, but you've got a very young quarterback who now has to make a very big third down play. <laughs> It is third down in Shevin. Detroit 17, Miami 13. And again, his thinking could well be that if I've got to hold him, I might as well have to hold him here if I don't go in. Force him to kick, I'm going to have field position to go in and score. I mean, that also becomes part of the of the very, very decision-making process. Very true, the field position is a part of it. But again, see, here if you got inside the five-yard line and you can't score a touchdown, it's so much easier to kick the field goal. If you have another 20 yards, say, if they, they cut from the 20-yard line, you can still get position to kick the field goal because you've got a kicker, Stoyanovich, who has a great leg. Miami with one timeout remaining. Detroit has two, two minutes and 40 seconds. In Don Shula's first quest for victory number 300. I think a lot of people just assumed that it was a formality coming up here to Detroit and getting that victory. Far from it. We now we're talking to some Detroit fans at halftime, and uh, they were thrilled with the... They, uh, I think some of the Detroit fans, including some of their owners, felt this, this way, but the Lions have certainly risen to the occasion. He rolls, throws, has it. Push down Detroit. Terrific catch by Robert Clark and a big play by Rodney Pete. And a gain of 15 yards. Converting on third and seven. You can see his reaction right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but don't go up the stands and touch anybody. That's right. That's right. Five yards. Only shake your fist. Sanders, his 30th carry of the ball game. You remember what we said earlier? We said 30 carries, and he a very definitive no. That's his personal high as a lion. The most he'd ever carried heading into this game was 28. But you know, as good as Barry Sanders is, the Lions are only going to go as far as Pete. And Miami takes their last timeout, stopping the clock at the 223 mark. And just watching the express Doc Dan Marino, of course, he looks older than 30 all of a sudden. But the reaction of Don Shula a moment ago is that was there miscommunication of calling the timeout? Well, that could have been. I think what has to happen is that after the first down, you tell, no, I think what it was is the coaches on the sidelines couldn't decide whether to let it run down to the two-minute warning or make the decision now. And it was a spontaneous decision that probably only cost him, though, in this case, only about four or five seconds. And now clock management becomes so key as far as both Miami and Detroit are concerned. The margin, four points, 17-13, 2-23 left to go in a very good football game. Very good football game, and you can see Wayne Font sweating it out a little bit. You know, Detroit isn't in this situation very often. There you can see Rodney Peach. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, Barry Sanders is a terrific runner, but they are only going to go as far as Rodney Peach can take them. Very dependent upon Rodney Peach because they don't have a history of great quarterbacks here for the Detroit Lions. You'd have to go clear back to the days of Bobby Lane before you talk about a quarterback in the same breath as some of the other Hall of Famers and great quarterbacks that exist now in the National Football League. Sanders carry, that is the 31st carry for him in the ball game. John Opperdahl makes the tackle and we will take the countdown now to the two-minute warning. Step aside, the score, Detroit, seven. This is Charlie Jones, Todd Christensen, two minutes to go, fourth quarter, 17-13, Detroit leads, and they face a third down and two. They have the tight end set in, in right now, which would indicate a run. This would be an interesting call. They have 
not been that successful running from this formation. Sanders over the top. Oh, what an effort! And they're going to give it to him. They're going to give him the extra effort. Normally in that situation, Charlie, when the guy gets stopped in midair, that's all they're going to give him. And it appears right there they're going to give him the second effort, and that is a first down on his 31st carry. He decided right here he's going to show his vertical leap. He's not coming to the outside. Now watch. He stopped right here. He stopped. Now watch what he does when he comes down. He comes right there, and he sprints up. Normally, the official right there will call it dead. But he did in this case. He enabled him to have the second effort, and that was a big, big first down for the Detroit Lions. That's salt of the game right there. when he sees the penalty flag down and it's against him in frustration he slams his helmet down that's the demonstration penalty so now it's first and goal for the Raiders instead of the Broncos taking over at their own two yard line it's now at the nine for LA Napoleon McCallum weaving his way through traffic to the five stacked up at the four Jim Lucas in the stop for the Broncos. What a change of fortunes. She had a big hurry. So now they still want to hold L.A. to only three, making it a seven-point margin. With the, with the big sack a few plays ago by Holmes, you, you thought that Denver was on, on the way, but some possible mistakes here. Smith in front of the... Pulling in McCallum once again. McCallum gets the call, trying to go to the outside, takes it inside, down to the one. He's a large running back at 6'2", 225. Well, number 77, Carl Mecklenburg, tries to run through on this play. Now, why we say when we say run through, you'll see the linebacker try to just run behind the block. See there on Wisniewski, but a little late in the game, a little tired, slips, doesn't turn the corner, back's able to make five, six yards on it. When you run through, the coaches used to say, you better get there. So third and goal at the one-yard line, Steve Wright has been announced as an extra tight end, the regular right tackle for the Raiders. As they go with a three tight end alignment. McCallum and Smith in the backfield. Smith this time. Is he in? Yes, touchdown Raiders. a flag down in the play though a flag down around the seven yard line does it go against Los Angeles yes I can tell by the reaction of Jay Schrader we have illegal procedure against the offense number 66 number 66 reported as an eligible receiver number 87 lined up on the line of scrimmage making him ineligible we have a five-yard penalty and repeat the down third down so steve wright came in andrew glover was obviously lined up improperly you've got to have the man on the, the at the end of the line of scrimmage on the weak side off the line he lines up on it very very costly the, the thing about the Raiders, though, is they are starting to wear down the Broncos. You can just see it. The Broncos are slow getting up. Third and goal now back at the six, and Schrader uses another timeout. So L.A. only has one remaining with still 9.24 left of the contest. We'll be right back to the Coliseum.
car born of intelligent engineering. It's 100,000 ideas fused into one. It's responsive, innovative, refined. It's a driver's side airbag and anti-lock brakes. Introducing the all-new 88 Royale LS. Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. Guys, it doesn't get any better than this. Bob Pullum was wrong, because when a crate of lobsters fell from the sky, it got somewhat better. And when the Swedish bikini team dropped by, it got a little better. And when an old Milwaukee truck showed up, it most certainly got better. Old Milwaukee and old Milwaukee light. It just doesn't get any better than this. Inside your smooth running engine is a torture chamber. And under these grueling conditions, only one leading motor oil meets the world's toughest requirements for viscosity breakdown, Castrol. The only leading motor oil that provides maximum protection against viscosity and thermal breakdown. So use Castrol. After all, why make things tougher on your engine? Castrol GTX, engineered for today's smaller cars. NBC Sports coverage of the National Football League is brought to you by Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. By Castrol, engineered for today's smaller cars. By Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. And by Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee Light. It doesn't get any better than this. Costly penalty to Jay Schrader in the Raiders' offense, but they have taken over on the line of scrimmage. You can see what happened in the first half, time of possession. Well, a completely different story in the second half is now you combine the first three quarters plus the Raiders with the ball better than 31 minutes. So early in the second quarter, the Raiders started to control the ball, and it's continued all the way through the third and early portion of the fourth. Now, third and goal from the six. Schrader on the timing pattern in the corner for Galt, and he's out of bounds. And actually, Mervyn Fernandez was out of bounds. Defending Charles Demery. And they will have to settle for three if they can come up with three, as Jager has already missed one today. Well, Fernandez is a guy they like to go into the timing pattern. He's 6'3". He's, he jumps so well, and he's got good hands. There, you can see how close they are to scoring. So Jager missed on that field goal try just before the end of the first half. A 32-yard try. This will be a 23-yard attempt. Trying to put the Raiders up by seven. It's out of the hold of Jeff Gossett, the punter. The exchange is a clean one, and the kick perfect. So somewhat of a moral victory for the Denver defense. They force the Raiders to settle for three, and Denver is down by seven. Guys, doesn't get any better than this. Doug Patterson was wrong, because when the shark then started playing, it got somewhat better. And when the Swedish bikini team came surfing by, it got a little better. And when a treasure chest of old Milwaukee washed ashore, it most certainly got better. Old Milwaukee and old Milwaukee light. It just doesn't get any better than this. Introducing a car so intelligently engineered, its elegance and grace can be measured along these lines or graded on a curve. The 1992 Oldsmobile 88 Royale, beautifully redefined and nimble enough to prove that a straight line isn't always the best way to get from point A to point B. Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. In making an artistic statement, one's personal aroma shouldn't do the talking. So I use Right Guard Sports Stick with maximum protection. A true artiste should be known for inspiration, not perspiration. Right Guard Sports Stick. Anything less would be uncivilized. Recently, this couple walked out of Little Caesars with extra pepperoni and extra cheese without paying for it. It's lots of lots of two pizzas with extra pepperoni and extra cheese for $8.98. It's a steal. Lots of lots of. Witness the unmatched drama and emotion of a great golf tradition as Payne Stewart and Paul Azinger lead America against Europe's best, the Ryder Cup, later this month on NBC. 
The Raiders settle for a 23-yard field goal. Jeff Jager and now lead the Broncos by a seven. Very close to fair once again in the fourth quarter at the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Joel Myers along with Dan Hampton. 9-17 left in regulation. And Dan, an interesting scenario coming up for John Elway and the Denver Broncos. They dominated the Cincinnati Bengals in the opener last week, scoring 45 points and a cakewalk. But all of a sudden, a different situation. We'll get to that right after the kickoff as Alton Montgomery is back deep along with Derek Russell. Let's see if they have better communication than we saw the last time it was kicked away by Jeff Jager. This time it'll be Montgomery by himself from the six-yard line. And the Raiders swarm into the ball as he can't even get back to the 10. Flag down. Will it be a face mask penalty on the tackle? Steve Smith, one of the first ones down there. You know, when Dan Reeves more or less turned the keys over to Elway, he, he really felt like this was something that would, would be great for the entire club. If John's excited, the whole club is. And, you know, they played so well. Face mask on the kicking, on the kicking team, team, five, five yards, yards, first down. As I was saying, last week they played so well with Elway at the controls. You know, we talked to him yesterday, Joel, and he said how he kind of gets this gut feeling about the personnel and the play that he wants to call. Well, it was easy last week. This week, it's a little different. He's behind. And now, as you see the face mask penalty against the Los Angeles Raiders, will he second-guess that gut decision after he gets up to the line? You can see the difference. The Broncos, this is only their second possession of the entire second half. Over the middle, it's complete to Perryman, and he's got a first down to the 25-yard line. We'll be right back to the Coliseum in Los Angeles, but first, an update with Bob Costas. All right, to the King Dome in Seattle, Joel, and here is Jeff Kemp with the second of his two touchdown passes on the day. Tommy Kane wide open to haul in the 17-yarder. All the Jets have to show for themselves is a pair of Pat Leahy field goals. It's Seattle by a pair of touchdowns in the fourth, 20 to 6. Thank you, Bob. It's first and 10. Elway on the play. Action has time and has a man. It's complete. Close to the 40-yard line. Another first down. Mark Jackson on the reception of 15 yards. So Watch two quick Ryan passes Ball. by John Elway. Well, as we were talking about the fact that Elway feels these things in his gut. What he thinks will work. He sees the defensive personnel, then he comes back with his own. Here, Jackson just clearing out across the middle. Ronnie Lott, the, the super safety for Frisco for, for many years, maybe not as quick as he once was. They try to sneak up underneath him. So Denver has it first and 10. This drive started back at their own 13-yard line. They're now at their own 40. Flags up into the air. Dead ball foul coming up on Denver. Well, it looks like Townsend jumped first, and then Hamilton, the... Uh, Townsend will jump, drawing Hamilton into a pass-blocking position, jumping early. So... Start on the offense prior to the snap. Five-yard penalty, still first down. The thing is, you know, the defensive player can move and, and kind of hitch. That offensive player can. He's got to sit in there like a rock. That's Darrell Hamilton, the left tackle in his third year from North Carolina. For so many years, they said the Bronco offensive line was efficient, but a little bit too small, no longer. When you look at Lanier, Wydell, Carts, Sean Farrell, Darrell Hamilton, a 300-pounder. First and 15 now for Elway and the Broncos. Their own 35-yard line. Delay to Gaston Green. He stumbles as he gets out of the backfield. No gain on that carry. Well, the ground game has never really gotten underway today for the Denver Broncos. Those early scores in. Buffalo now 2-0. The Rams even at 1-1, just like the New York Giants. But Phoenix is surprising 2-0. Beating Jim McMahon and the Eagles. Your team, Dan, slipping past Tampa Bay. They are 2-0. The Chicago Bears, Miami, even at 1-1 with their win today. We'll come back with more scores on the 10-minute ticker. After the second and 15 play of the Broncos from their own 35, Elway in trouble on his way down. Tom Benson swarming there. Great Townsend forced him to the inside, though. We talked about how they had a spies program set up early with Winston Moss. Now they've taken Townsend, put him on the line, 51 at the top of your screen, will try to get up. He comes back underneath. Here Townsend gets upfield. Elway, not seeing anything at first, thinks he can try to get up and buy some time. The Raider lineman too quick and collapse on him. Critical third down as you see other finals around the NFL because now there's under seven minutes left in the fourth. Broncos are down by seven. And this is third and 17 after the sack. 
Elway moving the pocket, has plenty of time, wants to go back the other way, and overthrows Mark Jackson. Jackson coming back to the quarterback when Elway thought he was going to start towards the sideline. As we talked earlier about the moving pockets, see, Elway is one of those guys, that, almost a hybrid quarterback, that if you could build one, that's the guy. He's big, he's strong, he's mobile, and he can throw on the run. Getting out to the, his left there in a moving pocket, trying to buy some time, he couldn't uncover anyone. Speaking of moving pockets, I used to have an account with one of those, Joe. Six and a half minutes left in the fourth. Mike Horan ready to punt it away and barely gets it away. It goes off the side of his foot. As it hits David Treadwell, the place kicker on the Denver bench. So a poor punt. And when we come back, the Raiders have it at the Denver 49. It's a car born of intelligent engineering. It's a hundred thousand ideas fused into one. It's responsive, innovative, refined. It's a driver's side airbag and anti-lock brakes. Introducing the all-new 88 Royale LS. Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. In financial matters, as in life, everybody's different. Different needs, different goals. The Principal Financial Group understands. Our financial services are as unique and individual as you are. Personalized solutions that offer each customer an advantage. That's the Principal Edge. It's made us one of America's largest. So for diversified products that fit your financial needs to the letter, look for the Principal Edge. Oh, the things people come up with to talk you out of a Michelin tire. It's just as good as a Michelin. It lasts as long as a Michelin. You'll trust it like a Michelin. Well, they can try anything they want. Because once you've owned a Michelin tire, there's nothing anyone can do to talk you out of one. One year ago, a wing and a prayer helped Notre Dame capture a dramatic come-from-behind victory. Caught by Adrian Gerald on a deflection. What a play! In two weeks, these teams meet again as the Michigan State Spartans invade South Bend to battle the Fighting Irish. Notre Dame football is home on NBC. Denver punter Mike Oran really felt the pressure on that last one, only came up with a 16-yarder. As there's 626 left of the contest, the Raiders lead it by seven, and in turn, Dan, he has put pressure on that defense that's been on the field the entire second half. They're small, and they need some rest. Roger Craig on the carry. He scoots under a tackle inside the 45. It's about four on the carry. Now, any more than a first down, and they could basically... They can barely afford to give up even a first down with the clock moving. And they're close to Jeff Jaker territory. Yards on the ground, a big difference. And that's the way the Raiders have been able to take over the trenches and control the ball. Well, the first half, they were pretty ineffective in anything they wanted to do. But in the third, you saw how that one pass stretching the defense has opened up Pandora's box. Schrader feels no pressure. He's getting good chunks of yardage with his ground game. He can throw at will. Five minutes, 45 seconds left in County. Second and six from the 45. The Broncos do have all three timeouts remaining. Roger Craig on the carry over to the right side. He gets four. So he's two short of the first down and a huge third down coming up for the Denver Broncos defensive front seven because you know what the Raiders want to do. They want to keep pounding the ball and keep the clock running. They don't want to put it up in the air with Jay Schrader for the potential of an incompletion. Well, Mecklenburg here knows that he's going to have to get up force, kind of shields off his his blocker the offensive guard maybe overruns a little bit now early in the game it's easy to get your instincts and everything and get that target put that head in the middle of those shoulder pads late in the game you're a little tired you get a little sloppy third and two craig has 87 yards now on 24 carries trader is throwing he's looking for smith who's got it and he gets the first down he's not going to bound by jeff mills but a little bit too late as we head back to Bob Costas for an NFL Live update. 
And actually, Joel, this one is about tennis. Stefan Edberg knocked out of the U.S. Open in the first round last year, comes back to win it all this year. He blitzes Jim Courier in the final 6-2, 6-4, 6 love, and Courier hadn't lost a single set coming in. It's the fifth Grand Slam title for Edberg. He's never won at the French, but he's won twice at Wimbledon, twice in the Australian. This is first U.S. Open title. Joel? Bob right now, just like Stefan Edberg. The Denver Broncos being slammed in straight sets in the second half by the L.A. Raiders as Roger Craig pounds it to the outside. Good yardage on first and 10 from the 37 down to the 31. A carry of six yards. Craig coming out of what, what we call a brown formation. He had that big fullback up there to lead on the corner. Here he just runs away from the linebackers. There at Mecklenburg. Raiders are sticking to their knitting. Now, the, the Broncos will be expecting run every down. Look for Schrader to come up with something cheap and deep down the middle for a quick strike. It's tough to win games when you've only had the ball twice in the entire second half, and that's the story right now for the Denver Broncos. Second and four. The ball of the 31 of the Denver Broncos. Schrader on the quick one. He's got his receiver. Galt for a first down to the 25, and he stays in bounds. We're talking with Wade Phillips yesterday. He said, for our defense to be effective, we've got to be able to get turnovers, get them stopped. Don't let them keep us on the field all day. Exactly the opposite. No turnovers, and they're out there the entire third quarter. Here, Galt runs a quick hitch, just goes down the field, turns around, gets the ball. Those corners are, have got to respect the speed. They get back off of him. That's almost a given with Willie. First and 10 at the 25, well within range of Jeff Jager now. If they were to try a field goal from there, it'd be about a 42, 43 yard attempt. Unless they call a timeout, Joel. <laughs> Four minutes remaining to the contest. Craig gets the call and finds a hole over to the right side. That middle threesome has been sensational. Wisniewski, Mosbar, and Montoya. The two guards in center for the Raiders. Well, here Craig in the nose guard takes on Wisniewski. Uh, excuse me, Mosbar in the center. There, Craig and loses a battle. Now, the huge Mosbar, the Montoyas, the Wisniewskis are starting just to wear those defensive players down. You've got to exert an awful lot of, of physical energy each time the ball is snapped, and by the end of 50, 60, 70 plays, you're spent. It's hard to get something going. Long day for the defensive front. Since midway through the second quarter, it seems like they've been on the field the entire way for Denver. 3.15 and running. Remaining to the fourth, second and five. Ball just outside of the 20. Craig now with 98 yards on the ground. This time Steve Smith tripped up, crossing the line of the 20. Falls forward for a couple of the 18. And now Denver will use their first timeout of the second half. Timeout. Denver. Denver. Their first timeout. timeout. This is a 40 second timeout. timeout. Well, Bronco fans remember what happened after the 87 season a trip to the Super Bowl they fell to 8-8 eight eight in 88 89 turned out to be another sensational season another appearance of the Super Bowl let's not forget even though they're losing now by seven Dan they're playing a last place schedule they're going to have New England a couple of times this year they're going to have Phoenix on the road Cleveland at home and don't forget about next Sunday it all starts at 1230 Eastern with NFL Live you'll see either Miami Detroit Cincinnati Cleveland early and then the late games, the Colts right here at the Coliseum to match up with the Raiders. Some will see Seattle and Denver or Buffalo and the Jets. It all starts with Bob Costas, O.J. Simpson, and Will McDonough at NFL Live at 1230 Eastern. But back to that thought, a last play schedule for the Denver Broncos. They have to be considered a force this year just because of that and the defensive personnel they've gotten back from the injuries and that last play schedule. Well, today doesn't make or break the, the season for anyone, but... You're seeing some of the things that you know happened last year occur. They didn't get any turnovers on defense for the, for the Broncos. The Raiders are able to control the clock and kind of pound on them. Now, the, the thing is, the Raiders in today's game have succeeded in their game plan. Denver has not. Raiders, of course, with the first place schedule after that 12-4 and four season last year, losing in the AFC title game decisively to the Bills, much tougher. As you can see, Buffalo there and then closing out with a game at New Orleans and Kansas City within their own division. Third and three. Can they punch it inside the 15 with Roger Craig carrying the load? Craig tied up. Doesn't get there. I think it was Carlo Mecklenburg, big number 77, who stopped him on third and short. 
long time ago, Mecklenburg's name was the Snow Goose. Here you'll see him. We talked about running through. There he takes on the offensive tackle, butts under him, and just hangs on. This is a 40-second timeout. That was James Fitzpatrick, the right tackle, subbing for Steve Wright on that play. The good not fend off Carl Mecklenburg. So another timeout for the Denver Broncos. They've got one remaining. And looking forward to NBC's coverage of Notre Dame football. It continues Saturday, September 21st, when the Irish host the Spartans of Michigan State. Every year, that is a classic. Two teams squared off last year. Luck of the Irish prevailed. You remember when quarterback Rick Myers passed, deflected off the chest of a Spartan defender in the end zone and into the hands of Notre Dame wide receiver Adrian Gerald. That was actually on the Michigan State two-yard line. It set up the game-winning score, though, with 34 seconds left for a 20-19 victory for the Fighting Irish. So George Perlis' team out for revenge. Michigan State and Notre Dame. It's all coming up on Saturday, the 21st. So now, Bill goal try for Jeff Jager. He is two for three on the afternoon. He missed a 32-yarder. He hit a 23-yarder and also a 29-yarder. This will be an attempt of 34 yards. It's out of the hold of Jeff Gossett, the punter. And they've got that cushion they were looking for. So now a 10-point advantage for the Los Angeles Raiders. And all the Broncos can hope for is a quick touchdown and an onside kick with only one timeout remaining. Well, although the, the Broncos defense has been playing pretty well, they haven't got the ball for the offense. The Raiders' defense ha has more or less dominated this game. They have not given Elway a chance to get that offense out of track, out, out of gear, whatever. That's the story. The Raiders' defense has been awesome today. Don't forget tonight on NBC, one-hour NBC primetime preview featuring the new Saturday morning lineup of Cartoon Fun. It's NBC's world premiere Cartoon Spectacular. It's followed by a special edition of Unsolved Mysteries on a special night. That is the nine-core presentation of the NBC miniseries Blind Faith, starring Robert Yorick and Growing Pains' Joanna Kearns. That all comes your way tonight on NBC. Two minutes, 48 seconds remaining. One timeout left for the Raiders. One as well for the Denver Broncos. The Broncos have to feel this is just like last year, another warm afternoon in downtown Los Angeles. Last year, they lost 14-9 when the Raiders' defense scored all 14 points. The offensive unit did not have a productive day. And again, the offense sparked by the big plays from the defense. Yeah, that and the fact off. Schrader really didn't force any bad players upon himself. Now Played Montgomery super. will bring it back from the 13-yard line. Yeah. They needed a big return. Montgomery staying alive past the 25. Falls forward across the 30 with the help of one of those big linemen behind him. So now, can this quick strike attack of John Elway come through? 36 seconds left before the two-minute warning. No doubt what he's going to do. Let's see if they exclusively go to the four wide receiver alignment that hasn't posed that many problems for the Los Angeles Raiders today, even though it posed so many problems for them last week. And I'm kind of surprised, Dan, we didn't see more of the four wide out set. Well, that's the way they've really got Cincinnati off balance. They haven't been able to do it with the Raiders trouble he's going to run it and sliding across the 41 he'll be spotted right down at the 41 yard line those late scores on the ITT 10 minute ticker San Francisco up by 17 now for the Chargers and a 20 to 6 lead for the Seattle Seahawks what a difficult week it's been for the San Diego Chargers firing their offensive coordinator and assistant head coach Ted Tolder Elway had the ball batted back and wisely batted it down so it'll be second and just about a yard once again, and Townsend there. You know, you talk about the Raiders being an old football team. They were the oldest team in the league last year. But they've got a bunch of old war horses. Howie Long, Jerry Robinson, Townsend's getting some age, but they're still so good late in the game. Elway on the sneak has the first down, but a flag is down on the play. Did somebody move too quickly for Denver? No, it'll go against L.A. Delay. 12 in on the field for the defense. Five yards. First down. So the penalty stops the clock with 2.03 remaining. That's Dave Adolph, the defensive coordinator for the Los Angeles Raiders. His team has really come all the way back from 
47 points scored against them last week for the run and shoot of Warren Moon. Well, that and the, the loss of Buffalo, I think they've answered an awful lot of questions today. Last play before the two-minute warning, Elway looking for help. He looks for the running back who's in for the first time, Reggie Rivers, the rookie from Southwest Texas, in and out of his hands. Wouldn't have gone for much anywhere. We'll be right back for the final minute 54 at the Coliseum. Percent are still on the road. Safely say. Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. The Raiders. The Colts. Eric Dickerson returns to L.A. next Sunday. Hello. Now let's take a look at today's Cannon camcorder replay of the game. It belongs to the putter for the Los Angeles Raiders, Jeff Gossett, doing his best to pick up his card from the Screen Actors Guild. He definitely got hit, but he wanted to make sure everybody knew about it. Well, here's the thing. You know, when you're in Hollywood for the play of the game, well, you know what they say, Joe, when in Rome, see the Parthenon, right? <laughs> <laughs> Only in L.A. Oh. I'm Joel Myers alongside Dan Hampton. A minute 54 seconds left in the fourth quarter. The Broncos down by 10, 16 to 6. One timeout remaining for John Elway. Second and 10. Elway in trouble. Townsend got him. And then cleaning up after Townsend got him around the pads, Anthony Smith, their first round draft choice of last year, who missed the entire season with an injury. Late in the game, Elway having to take time to see the field develop. Townsend playing a Townsend playing an excellent, excellent game today, breaking the pocket down time and time again. There, Smith comes around and finishes it off, finishes the play it's off. But Howie Long, Townsend, Scott Davis, those guys are the ones that have just been controlling the line of scrimmage, creating all the problems for Elway, making him get out of the pocket, cutting down the time to see the field. The Raider defensive front controlled this game, and that's what Howie Long said to us, Joel. He said, hey, we, last week we were a non-factor. This week we've got to be the story. I remember your response with Howie Long asked you, do you miss it? Yeah, I said, yeah, sure, you miss a train wreck. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of fun, but, it, you know, it's it's beyond me now. That, that guy right there, he was on the Pro Football Writers Association team of the decade, and he, he truly is a, a terrific football player. And, Last week, he was asked to do some different things and, and more or less just try to control the line. This week, he was able to rush the passer, and Howie Longs will have a smile on his face come Wednesday. Felt like a dancing bear in the circus last week. Really couldn't rush the passer. And now, last chance, third and long, Elway going out. Winston Moss yes. on the spy. The spy stayed at home until he saw Elway run out of room. Well, Don Knotts would be very proud of this play. Moss having the speed and the range to be able to close on Elway. Elway's one of the fastest guys in the league when at quarterback. Here you'll see trying that floating pocket, that sliding pocket. There Moss just tracks him down, never giving him a chance to set, plant, and look at the receivers. So now it's fourth and forever. Just outside of the 30-yard line. Clock stops a minute 43 left. They've got to take it inside the Raider 44 to pick up the first down. So got it fourth and 25. Pressure again, Townsend. Elway in trouble, breaks the containment. The pass way too short to Zool, though. Does he stay in bounds? Yes, he does. Does he get the first down? Yes, he does. Inside oh. the 40, down to the 37. Do you believe it? I wonder if John Elway felt that play in his gut when he called it. I don't think Zool was the primary. Unbelievable. <laughs> They're out of timeouts. They've got to hurry. Clock moving, a minute 10 remaining. Snap a low when Elway comes away with it, though. And it's batted down, trying to go for Mark Jackson at about the 28-yard line. Greg Townsend got a piece of it. But at least it stops the clock. Townsend pretty tired after that last play, having to chase Elway some 30, 40 yards, trying to get him down. But even if you're a good defensive, even if you can't get to the quarterback, you can do some different things there more or less bull rushing the tackle back into the pocket. Then watching Elway's eyes. When Elway spots the receiver, getting your hands between the receiver and the quarterback. They need six in a hurry. 64 seconds left. Pressure again coming from Townsend. And a thrown behind the intended target, Steve Sewell. Wanted to take it and head for the sideline. 
So now it brings up a third and ten from the 37 with 59 ticks left on the clock. Well, Joel, Ken Lanier, the, the right tackle for the Denver Broncos, I always thought he was one of the finer offensive tackles that I would play against. Today, he hasn't been what he normally is. Townsend, Howie Long, different players have went by him. He's not getting the job done, giving Elway enough time to see the field. It's a hard job when they know you're going to pass block, but he's still, he's got to find a way to get it done. Third and ten. Pressure again on Elway up the middle. Over the middle, it's batted away by Torin Dorn. Once again, Townsend on an inside rush right into the face of Elway. Lanier not able to get him stopped. Elway has to get out to the right for something in the middle. We now, as a receiver, at this stage in the game, they know the defensive backs are going to be in a deep four zone. They're just going to run a bunch of quick curls, a hitch, if you will. There are the cornerbacks playing smart. Figured that's what Elway would go to. Last chance for the Broncos in Elway. 53 seconds left. Fourth and 10 from the 37. Looking for Mark Jackson deep. He got away from Thorne. It's complete. Inside the five to the three. But the Broncos running out of time, and the clock is moving. 34 yards on the reception by Jackson. Thorne on the coverage. One of the Raiders kicked the football. The officials had to stop the clock. The bad boys are back. Raiders use their final timeout. They're up by 10. And it's first and goal down at the three-yard line as we look back on the reception by Jackson. There, Washington getting a little bit cute. It's lull to sleep. No, 46. Torn Dorn. Torn Dorn. Get, gets lulled to sleep a little bit, trying to play on his hip pocket for the quick curl. Jackson just runs a streak to the corner. There, Dorn, just a, just a half stride off. Perfect throw by Elway. Nice reception. So the Broncos get a break on the timeout call because the Raiders didn't have time to really adjust defensively. So it stops the clock with 30 seconds remaining. Well, traditionally, the Raiders are one of the toughest teams in the league to score on inside the 20. Last week, they gave up three rushing touchdowns. They only gave up four in the whole last season. They wanted to get some air, get those big linemen ready to stop the run. Sewell, the only one in the backfield. Elway throwing on first and goal. Wallace coming from the backside. It's complete to Sewell. Touchdown, Denver. With 25 seconds left. Well, at least we'll get a chance to see that onside kick. A three-yard pass to Steve Zool. Elway getting outside the pocket. Receiver just running away from the, the safety, Anderson. Can't run it any better than that, folks. Anderson having a, a bad groin this week. Maybe not able to close as quickly as he'd like. Treadwell with the point after. And it is a three-point game. With 25 seconds left, the difference in the contest right now, that 34-yard field goal by Jeff Jager. And that was after the 16-yard punt by Mike Horan. So the special teams have not helped out the Denver Broncos all day long. We've seen... The two deep backs run into each other, have problems on just about every kickoff return, getting it past the 15 or 20-yard line as we check in those late scores and all the early ones as well in the 10-minute ticker. But the special teams definitely need some work for the Denver Broncos. Now, let's see if the hands unit of the L.A. Raiders can come up with the ball on the onside kick that'll be arriving. Denver plays kicker David Treadwell. The executive producer of NBC Sports is Terry O'Neill. Our coordinating producer, John Veratsis. Today's game has been produced by Glenn Adamo and directed by Tom Edwards. Our associate director, Ray Benassi. Our production associate, Bill Herbstman. And our technical director, Keith Scamahorn. They're all lined up to the left for the onside kick from Treadwell. And here it comes. It goes 10 yards. Can they keep it in bounds? No. It rolls out of bounds. It was the ultimate, though, if you're a Denver Bronco. You had a chance for the ball. Well, you know, the, you practice this play 
all the time, all through camp, all through practice. That was executed perfectly, except they didn't get the ball. Treadwell you can see Atwater trying to bat it up inbounds. I don't think I've ever seen one actually executed better and not get the football. Atwater had a chance just a little out of his reach. And of course the Raiders trying to bat it out of bounds. Clock never starts until there is possession. There was no possession so still 25 seconds left. It seems like whoever wins the first game in the season series between these two wins goes on for the sweep since Dan Reeves took over in 1981. Only once have these two teams split the season series. So what a big edge for the L.A. Raiders, knowing they've got one up. They swept them, taking that last game in Denver last year, 23-20, to after winning here 14-9. to There is no foul on the play. We had a legal touching by the kicking team beyond 10 yards. The ball was then touched by the receiving team prior to going out of bounds. Is the receiving team ball at the spot of out of bounds. First down. Dan Reeves wanted another crack at it. And wants Dick Hantak to come over. He, he's saying, he's saying that if our guys touch it and it goes out of bounds, then we re-kick. It's our fault. The officials are contending that the Raiders touched it before it went out of bounds. Reeves is saying no. It did look like after Atwater got his hands on the ball, though, there was a Raider at the bottom that was forcing it out of bounds. Well, if that's true, then it's Raider ball at the point touch. And one last look. Okay, that's Fernandez. Look at the bottom of the screen. It is off of the Broncos' foot. It, it Reeves is right. He's continuing. And the play is being reviewed now. Royal he Cathcart, is, the replay official. He is contending that we have to re-kick. Give us one more shot. Put another bullet in the chamber. Okay. It was a... It could be a Raiders foot. It's hard to say. <laughs> it, Please pull out the microscope. Reminds me of that Linguini we had last night, Joel. It's just a, ball, just a mess. Called on the field, last touch by the receiving team. So one snap for the Raiders, and that will do it. There wasn't enough, I guess, evidence to overturn it, but Reeves really felt like it, it was a chance to get another play. Well, the Denver offense was really never on the field in the second half of play. That was the difference in the contest. The Raiders controlled the trenches, pounded the ball effectively, and then started to find Fernandez and Galt. Well, it wasn't so much the fact that Elway didn't develop his offense and do the things that he wanted to do. It was more or less, he never had a chance, Joel, and, and you've got to take your hat off to the Raiders. Their defense played so well today. After getting blown out so badly last week, they showed up, showed up tough. Well, coming in, nine of the last 13 between these two had been decided by three or less. And true to form, make it 10 out of the last 14 decided by three or less. These two, of course, getting ready for a matchup later in the season at Mile High Stadium in Denver. But I think it's safe to say it is going to be a completely different story this year for the Denver Broncos as opposed to last season when they were 5-11. and 11. That final score once again, the Raiders beat the Broncos 16 to 13. Both teams now after two weeks of the season with a one and one record. And tonight on NBC, it's NBC.